I hope you can all hear me well and uh, we are all here for this uh, session of uh, revising all the uh, PYQs for the last few years and uh, this is going to be a session where we are going to have a lot of sessions from you people. That's always nice because uh, whenever you have doubts, you will always, uh, you know, uh, also push me to, you know, read better and give you better answers. So keep keep asking me doubts, and it's always nice. And uh, let not uh, this be a one-sided uh, discussion with all of you. So I hope you are comfortable where, uh, wherever you are. Exams have been postponed a little, and uh, 30th of July is uh, quite a bit of time. But then uh, don't get too complacent. Uh, that's what happens that a uh, lot of you have gone back home and some of you not coming for the live classes which were happening here and there so don't get complacent and uh, please use this time to revise well and discuss with amongst uh, yourselves all right and uh, we are going to uh, bring a lot of uh, discussions with you the prep ladder forum and the uh, channel which is uh, dedicated for teaching all fmg students and of course even the need pg entrance students so please don't miss out on any of the sessions whether it's e for inict or for neat or for the mci sessions so this is the dedicated session for you guys mci students and uh, my favorite bunch of people like i always say so here goes we'll start with the first question uh, which of the following is an absolute contraindication to iucd insertion now, IUCD insertion, the, you know, uh, one big thing which is uh, being discussed is the use of IUCD with previous ectopic pregnancy. So, uh, now, what is your session? Come on, I'll, I'm going to ask you guys. Suppose a woman had an ectopic pregnancy and I have taken care of that and uh, now uh, she doesn't want to get pregnant for the next two years. So, what is the contraception I give? Can I give her an IUCD or not? Previous ectopic, can I give her an IUCD or not? Come, shoot your answers. I want to see this one. Okay, uh, all of you are anyway marking, uh, all of you are anyway marking uh, the answer which I'm looking for. Yes, that's good. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, very good. Uh, see, uh, whenever a person has unexplained vaginal bleeding, we don't give any hormones, we don't start any therapy, and uh, we definitely not going to put an IUCD device. What is the most common complication of an IUCD insertion? Don't say perforation. The most common complication of an IUCD insertion is that the patient has heavy periods. For the first three, four times, she's going to have heavy periods, and we tell her that, you know, for the first three, four times when you have your menstruation, please take some uh, mefenamic acid, uh, along with sometimes we also give tranosamic acid. All right, so we are going to understand this well that which of the following is an absolute contraindication. So HIV positive status, it is not a contraindication. A patient who's got uh, HIV can, a patient who's got HIV can take uh, IUCD. So it's not a contraindication. And previous ectopic pregnancy, please don't be in any doubt. I know uh, there were a lot of forums which are saying that if a person has an ectopic pregnancy, the, the person will, should not be given an IUCD. Whenever you give IUCD, please understand, when you give IUCD, the pregnancies are less and ectopic pregnancies are also less. Please, first of all, is she's not going to get pregnant in the first place. So how are you going to say that ectopic pregnancy is going to increase? Please don't be in any, any doubts. IUCDs do not increase ectopics. Please understand, if I give somebody an IUCD, first of all, she'll not get pregnant. If she doesn't get pregnant, how will the ectopic pregnancy rate increase? So that's as simple as that. Number two, if at all the IUCD fails and she conceives, then just rule out an ectopic pregnancy. Suppose a woman is taking an IUCD and she conceives, it is 95% going to be in the uterus. So if we see an a patient with an IUCD device here, let's say like this with the thread outside and this is the fallopian tube. So if she conceives with an IUCD, then 95 to 96 percent pregnancies will be inside the uterus, all right? Around 5 to 6 percent pregnancies will be in the fallopian tube. Normally, if a person conceives, then the incidence of an ectopic pregnancy is 1 to 2 percent. So it's as simple as that. If at all she conceives, then rule out an ectopic pregnancy, mostly the pregnancy will be inside the uterus. So yes, HIV positive status is not a contraindication, previous ectopic pregnancy is not a contraindication and history of previous PID is also not a contraindication. Unexplained vaginal bleeding is the answer that is definitely a contraindication to putting an IFCD. So what are you guys saying? Let me see. Okay. 
a <coughs> excuse me history of previous pid is not a history of previous pid is not a contradiction so i knew some of you will have a problem with that so i'll just show you the data so if i ask you this i is initiation and c is continuation so this is uh, from um, you know a very important college uh, uh, booklet a very important college i am not taking names here because uh, this is a private circulation so i'm not taking names here but it's a very important college booklet which is given for teaching the postgraduates and also for the general knowledge of uh, gana colleges across the uh, uh, the country so this college has given out the conditions where you can initiate a contraceptive device and you can continue the contraceptive device inc initiation and continuation so if you say for iucd this is regarding iucds i have got you this chart and in an iucd if a person has pelvic inflammatory disease if there is a current pelvic inflammatory disease then the medical eligibility criteria i didn't say that properly i think <laughs> medical eligibility criteria the medical eligibility criteria is 4 if it is 1 and 2 medical eligibility criteria if it is 1 and 2 then we can use the contraceptive method if it is 3 and 4 we don't give the contraceptive method and i have i think i have told you this earlier also so if a person is having a current pid then the medical eligibility criteria the mec is mec is 4 do not start but if a person has past pid see it's so clear no contraindication for initiation and no contraindication for continuation if there is past pid so that also is taken care of whatever doubts you had now the other one which you people are worried about is hiv okay hiv will also say if there is high risk of hiv or even if the person is having asymptomatic or mild hiv clinical disease so we can initiate one and two mec it is initiate it is two here we can initiate and we can continue so initiation and continuity with hiv positivity is not a problem of course if the person has full blown aids then that's a contraindication of course so that is severe or advanced hiv clinical disease then it is mec 3 3 and 4 if mec 3 and 4 is written anywhere in your exams don't give the contraceptive device and if it is mec 1 and 2 medical eligibility criteria 1 and 2 we can go ahead and give the device all right so let's go and see what is happening with the ectopic pregnancy when we talk about the ectopic pregnancy in ectopic pregnancy with respect to an iucd what is the eligibility criteria it is 1 can you see for initiation this is i here and this is for continuity it is 1 that means for previous ectopic pregnancy there is no problem if you have to go ahead and give a iucd as a contraception initiation and continuation previous ectopic no contraindication i'm showing you proof here okay so let's not get worried about this at all okay so anything else you are giving me uh, okay newly married couple with temporary spacing condoms ocps newly married couple see never we please one thing please remember uh, the gentleman names is dr keth dr keth please remember whenever we are talking about a newly married couple or any other couple let me tell you condoms are not the best contraceptive in any situation i know uh, i'm i'm a big person with i mean i'm a, a big controversial person i know i understand that whatever i speak becomes a controversy sometimes look here condoms are not ideal anywhere but a condition called pid if a person is having or std hiv if a person is having hiv std go ahead and give condoms as the best contraception otherwise condoms are you know if people too many people are having uh, you know casual intercourse with too many people that kind of intercourse you will have to give condoms okay that's the only place where it is of any use otherwise if there's a dedicated couple who is uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, they are not going to have sex with anybody else in their lives then why to, should they use condoms first of all it's going to be not as um, successful because the failure rate is 14 to 20% of condoms and then condoms are going to also interfere with the so called sexual pleasures so yes condoms are not ideal in any of the situations which you ask you in the exams but yes there are some places like if there is a person having hiv or stds we have to give condoms if there is a uh, uncontrolled diabetes which is uh, you know you cannot give combined pills you cannot give iucds there again we'll have to give condoms so if 
there is something some situations where nothing else will work then we can go ahead and give condoms otherwise there's regular questions which we ask you don't think of condoms as a first answer so if you take that condoms away from your uh, first answer in your mind then you'll never have problems in answering these questions so condom is out in the question which you asked me and a newly married couple if they want then you have to give combined pills couple staying in separate cities again don't say condoms Cu couple staying in separate cities again say IUCDs all right don't say condoms most of the places avoid thinking condoms and your answers will be correct all right okay So, uh, there is something about my image, I think uh, uh, my image can become a little bigger later on because it is not very important. What I am speaking is more important and uh, you are not here to see me I am sure. So, you guys uh, here to discuss the questions and uh, if required we will see I will send a message to my team if they want to uh, increase the size of the image a little bit that is uh, alright with them. Okay. So, I uh, will stay with the questions guys. Next question. All of the following regarding the non-scalpel vasectomy are correct except. So, when we are talking about non-scalpel vasectomy, now non-scalpel vasectomy is the process uh, procedure which has been uh, you know advertised a lot by the government of India because men do not actually uh, you know they are not very willing for getting conception done most of the times because of so much of taboo they have so many so many things they keep thinking about uh, you know it may interfere with their uh, uh, ability to work ability to lift weights ability to have sex uh, you know they may have some sort of cancer so so many myths are around about uh, vasectomy but yes we always do a lot of uh, promotion of non scalpel vasectomy we give more money for a person who gets a vasectomy done in the garment as compared to a person who gets a tubectomy done with the garment so non scalpel vasectomy is a perfect uh, way to a very simple surgery to do a permanent sterilization in a couple a tubectomy has far more complication because it's a mini laparotomy when we say a tubectomy we have to do a mini lap but in a non scalpel vasectomy only a stab incision small stab incision is given by the sharp artery forceps under local anesthesia of course and it gets over in 5 to 10 minutes and a tubectomy may get over in 5 to 10 minutes but it is also requiring a laparotomy even though it is called a mini laparotomy you have to get into the abdomen and all of you know far more women have died in tubectomies than a man with vasectomy. I have seldom heard about anybody having a major complication like death with vasectomy although uh, you know uh, anaphylactic reactions can happen to any of the drugs which you use but that is the rarest thing which I have heard about non scalpel vasectomy. Okay, so, when we say non scalpel vasectomy it is a small stab incision under local anesthesia they can be hematomas up to 5 percent of subjects yes that is correct sexual function falling healing is rarely affected rarely uh, I do not think it is ever affected it is all in the mind so that is also correct sterility immediately after vasectomy now that is the wrong answer ok all of the following uh, regarding NSV are correct except so sterility is not guaranteed immediately after vasectomy I will tell you why recanalization is possible the success of recanalization now that we can see here success of reanastomosis I am writing RA is up to 35 percent best centers around 35 percent of course some urologists will beg to differ and they say it is 35 to 50 percent but then go ahead with not more than 35 percent as a success of reanastomosis of a vasectomy when we say a tubectomy reversal a tubectomy reversal if I tell you it can be reversal let me write reversal can be as up to up to 80 percent tubectomy reversal can be as uh, successful as 80 percent ok. So, why is sterility not guaranteed immediately after vasectomy because if we see the uh, general tract of a man you see if I have cut the vas here see I will show you the vas first see uh, ok now this is the uh, testes and this one is the epididymis here and this is the vas which is going like this. and now this is the seminal vesicles here. So, if I am if I am ligating the vase here somewhere 
if I am liking the vas here some way, then you can see that the path distal complete path here you can understand this complete path, this complete path just a minute, this complete path here, this will be having sperms and it will take up to 20 ejaculates for this to empty. So that is why for up to as long as 3 months or 20 ejaculates, so 3 months. or 20 ejaculates, it is going to take 3 months or 20 ejaculates for the person to empty his uh, vas which is distal to this block which we have done. So for this time either he finishes 20 ejaculates or 3 months then only we will confirm that is azospermic. Yes, we do not say that okay if you do 20 ejaculates you can go ahead and have sex without protection with your wife. No, we do not say that. They have to come to me and we will do a semen analysis and the semen analysis should show azoospermia. So that azoospermia when I see, then only I say that the person is now safe to have sex without protection and ideally that is two, two semen analysis in the gap of one month. So two semen analysis showing azoospermia. So it is a slightly um, a tedious uh, process if you go by the ideal deadlines, you know ideal guidelines rather. So ideal guidelines is that he gets a vasectomy done and next 3 months he is still not safe and then he has to come for a semen analysis at least once he has to come. So that is why also they are very reluctant to follow the non-scalpel vasectomy but it is an excellent technique. It is a very simple procedure and gives very fast results and uh, very good results rather and it is uh, very safe as compared to a tubectomy. Complications are far lesser. All right, so uh, any um, ideas you have, any sessions, uh, so pick aapka uh, image bada do or altaf ko dikh nahi raha hai. Um, okay, that has been taken care of, my friends say. Now, I am saying uh, 20 ejaculates, I know some of you uh, will also say 30 ejaculates, but uh, Williams obstetrics says 20 ejaculates, so I must stick with that answer. Yes, there is, uh, there are a lot of sessions of 30 ejaculates and 3 months, either of them, whichever gets over earlier. But please write 20 ejaculates, do not say 30 ejaculates, okay? Chale. Take the next question. There is another similar question like this had come in your exams a few uh, years back. A male had a vasectomy one month ago, even after the procedure, his wife is now pregnant. What advice should have been given? That is a similar question that he should have been uh, using condom for 3 months. Uh, abstinence for 3 months is not a very practical advice and uh, nobody is going to follow that, isn't it? So uh, use condom for 3 months, that is uh, uh, best advice, similar question it was. Now we will take another question, a lady present with complaints of foul smelling greyish white discharge and a whiff test done on the discharge was positive. On examination clue cells were seen on microscopic examination. What is this condition and which is the drug of choice for this treatment? So you know they are very happy asking about this clue cells. They are so happy asking about this clue cells that it has become an absolute uh, essential for you to read bacterial vaginosis. You know even before I have started reading this question most of you started giving the answers. So yes I know all of you know about clue cells very well and you guys uh, I know are uh, perfect with this MCQ. But then uh, be very careful in the variations of the MCQs which keep coming in your exams. So clue cells is correct but please remember the variations about this MCQ. So we have the AMSELS criteria, the AMSELS criteria says that there is an alkaline pH and there are this clue cells and there is this WIF test which is positive. WIF test is basically that there is uh, uh, you know to the secretions the, if you add uh, uh, potassium uh, hydroxide then that will release an ammonical odor that is a whiff test and there is a creamy white discharge and there is a fishy smell and this fishy odor, fishy odor is more even uh, uh, more after sexual intercourse. So AMSEL criteria, these 5 criteria: alkaline pH, clue cells, whiff test, creamy discharge per vaginum, creamy white, grayish white, grayish discharge, creamy grayish discharge and the fishy odor. So any three of these, you know, at least three, three or more out of five is equal to diagnosis of the bacterial vaginosis. 
So yes, uh, the best answer for this one is C. Yes, most of you got that correct. Uh, I, I'm, I know that you guys know what a clue cell looks like. Now, this is a vaginal epithelial cell. Now, let me show you epithelial cell. It looks like something like this. See, the epithelial cell is, it's not a circular cell, epithelial cell. It's got a clean cytoplasm and a dark nucleus. Now, in this epithelium, there are hundreds of embedded bacteria hundreds of embedded bacteria. So basically, you must have seen this epithelial cell even when we do a pap smear. In pap smear, when you do, you will see these epithelial cells in the vagina and the cervix. Now, these are now loaded with these bacteria. So can you see this uh, epithelial cell? This is the epithelial cell. If I show you with this, uh, okay, now this is the epithelial cell. Now, it has got this nucleus here. There are two epithelial cells here and they are sitting over each other and this black, black dots, these black dots are the numerous bacteria which is giving the appearance of this clue cells. It's a clue. It's a clue that person has bacterial vaginosis. So that's an easy one. Yes, strawberry vagina is there, but uh, that is not in bacterial vaginosis. Strawberry vagina is in um, trichomoniasis. So don't get confused. Uh, drug of choice is metronazole. So yeah, if you want, I've given you this chart. I don't know whether you can see me. I mean, if you can see this chart nicely, I'm putting my head on a little side and please take a picture of this so that uh, Anytime you want to just uh, have all of this, I was teaching somewhere and uh, I got this, uh, yeah, I will stand like this for a moment. So, I was teaching somewhere and uh, I made this chart so that uh, people can, uh, you know, uh, you remember all of these things together so many times. Or maybe I have to go this side. Am I starting on the wrong side? Yeah, maybe I have to go on this side. Okay. So, I think uh, those who want to see this later on, so it's a clear view for this and all of uh, the, you know, the uh, so many things which keep coming in the discussion about uh, Kennedy acids, trachomoniasis and bactivaginosis in a tabulated column. I was teaching somewhere, so I was typing, you know, uh, my handwriting was going from bad to worse. So, I started typing and I kept this slide so that uh, sometimes there's so many things together. Okay. So, what are the drugs for medical abortion? So, when we are talking about medical abortion, yes, uh, that is uh, one of the favorite topics of MCQ exams. So, when we say medical abortion, in the first trimester, when we are doing inducing an MTP, uh, remember MTP now can be done up to 24 weeks, but 20 to 24 weeks, two doctors should be giving the opinion for doing the medical termination of pregnancy. So, first trimester when we are doing this, we must remember that uh, medical abortion is uh, for 9 weeks if we do, 9 weeks it is successful 95 percent and if we do for 7 weeks, that is up to 7 weeks if we do, it is 99 percent successful. So, in India, we do not say that you cannot do for 9 weeks, but it is preferred, it is recommended that in India, we do the medical abortion till 7 weeks, so that uh, we get 99 percent success. So, medical abortion use only the drugs and yes, what are the drugs? I am getting a lot of answers. Yes, very good. So, uh, a lot of you have given the right answer. So, mifepristone is a drug which is, what is mifepristone? Mifepristone is a antiprogestin. It is an antiprogestin and it is given in a dose of um, 200 uh, milligrams and uh, that is given orally. This is an oral drug, mifepristone and mesoprostol is in 800 micrograms. It is given vaginally. So, after 24 hours of the uh, mifepristone, mifepristone will kill the fetus and after 24 hours to 72 hours, you can give the uh, uh, mesoprostol. It is going to cause the contraction of the uterus. That is basically a PG, PGE1. So, that is going to cause contraction and expel. Always, please remember, please do an ultrasound first. Always do the ultrasound first. So, first thing for medical abortion, locate, locate the pregnancy. This is extremely important. Locate the pregnancy, then counsel regarding the drugs. Once you counsel regarding the drugs, then administer the drugs and then she bleeds. She can uh, take this uh, at home, you know, she can take the tablet orally and after 24 hours she can take the uh, mesoprostol vaginally and she can bleed 3-4 days at home and it is like a normal period. Sometimes we tell them it will be a little heavier than your normal period, that is all and she can easily do this at home. 
and uh, she can take the tablet, uh, both the tablets and when the bleeding finishes, we advise her to come back to us for doing a repeat ultrasound to make sure that it is complete. So, when the bleeding, once it is over, we do a repeat scan, we do a repeat scan. So, this came, you know, all of these, first uh, locate the pregnancy, then give the counseling regarding the drugs, how do you take the drugs orally or vaginally that you explain, explain regarding the bleeding, once the bleeding gets over, come back to me for an ultrasound. So, those who follow this advice properly, those people have 99 percent success and suppose somebody goes on bleeding a lot at home and she is getting a little uh, uh, sick because of the bleeding, then she is advised to come any time of the day or night to the gynecologist and the person will take care of this by doing a DNC. So, uh, we must understand this. All right, so let us move on and uh, go to uh, our next thing that uh, a young girl complains of not attaining MINAC with periodic abdominal pain to the hospital. On examination, the following presenting image is seen. What is the likely lesion the girl is suffering from? All right, okay. Okay, I think most of you got this correct. Yeah, see uh, this clue cell question and this uh, impofrenamine. See, I, I wanted to give you some tough questions, but you know when uh, we go for p uh, PYQs, uh, then we have to give you the questions which have come in the exams. So there are some very simple questions like this image, and this image is a straight away give uh, you know information about a person who is having a imperforate hymen. You can see that. So a normal hymen, uh, if you see the vaginal opening, a normal hymen will be something. You know, there's a vaginal opening here, and that's the so, if you see in the vulva, okay, so this is the yellow thing is the vaginal opening and this hymen, there is a hymen which is a uh, small layer of tissue around the vaginal opening. So, that if it is imperforate, so if it is imperforate like which we are showing here, then the patient will not be able to have periods, she will have, she will come to with primary amenorrhea and very important that she will complain of periodic pain abdomen, she will complain of periodic pain abdomen, okay. So, imperfect hymen image is here, Bartholin cyst, Gartner cyst, septate uterus, all of these are wrong. So, Bartholin cyst is in the vulva and Gartner cyst is high in the vagina, this is imperfect hymen. So, what do you do for imperfect hymen? Yes, what do you want to do for imperfect hymen? You will put a cross shaped incision like this, a cruciate incision to uh, take out the contents and then after doing this cross shaped incision. Once you do this cross shape, see once you do this incision like this, once you make the incision like this, then you cut along the edges. So, now you will have a hymen which will look like this. You should cut along the edges so that once you cut, then it should not close after that. So, this is how it looks like. Yes, yeah, some of you must have seen this uh, video in my so classes, those who have attended the live classes, happened. but then it is an excellent video. I mean, uh, nowadays, we are not getting many girls who come with imperfect hymen. This is one of the cases in my hospital and uh, this video is there for you to see. So, we made a cross shape incision and then we deepen it okay. and you can see so much of, uh, you know, pent up blood. She was a 16 year old girl who came with uh, a lot of pain, periodic pain and uh, for roughly 3 to 4 years, she was uh, holding back the menstrual blood. So, almost 2.2, 2.4 liters of blood came out, menstrual blood came out, all right. So, uh, I think, yeah, most of you uh, have gone away with this, yes. Right, wash with saline afterwards, yeah, that is correct, that is okay. Of course, you will have to wash the cavity, that is all right. About anything, any place where you have taken out pent up collection, you must give a lavage. That is okay. So, ultrasound image of uterus showing snowstorm appearance in which of the following condition? Now, uh, this image I think somehow it is not showing, but yes, snowstorm appearance is something like this. All of you in Russia and China, I know you must have seen snowing so many times. So, yes, these vesicles, these vesicles, if you see, they, if you open your window on a, uh, you know, 
on a snowy night and if it is snowing very hard then you will see a snowstorm kind of look. So, the snowstorm appearance that is another very easy question and uh, H mole they have been asking you about this. Uh, so, please do not miss out on these sitters, a lot of time the sitters will come in exams. So, hydratiform mole in a complete mole or a hydratiform mole, in a complete mole you will see the snowstorm appearance, in a partial mole you will see a fetus is seen. So, this fetus will then spontaneously die in, in utero, this fetus will die in utero. So, this presents as a missed abortion. So, please be careful what they are asking you. How does a complete mole look like? A complete mole looks or the hydratiform mole looks like a snowstorm appearance. But the problem is that now they are going to ask you partial mole. In a partial mole you see a fetus and the placenta does not look like a you know a very characteristic uh, snowstorm appearance all that you will not see in the placenta. So, you will see a fetus and that fetus suppose at 8 weeks you do the ultrasound the fetus is looking alive by around 12 weeks if you do, uh, repeat the ultrasound the uh, uh, fetus will be dead. So, that fetus is giving us a, a look that the baby this fetus had an abortion, it comes as a missed abortion. So, you evacuate the fetus, you take this products and send it to the path lab. Path lab fellow gives you a report after 5, 6 days that yes this was a case of a partial mole. Partial mole presents as missed abortion and this hydratiform mole will present with bleeding per vaginum. Most common presentation, most common presentation of a complete mole is bleeding PV, bleeding per vaginum. And please do not say, do not say passage of grape like vesicles, please for God's sakes do not say passage of grape like vesicles, that is the rarest of presentations. You must understand when they come out these vesicles when they come out from a tight cervix, these vesicles will get crumb, they will get crushed. So, there will be a blood mixed vaginal discharge, you will not see, you will not see uh, uh, passage of vesicles. So, passive vesicles is actually a rare symptoms. What actually can come as a uh, exam question that the uterus, uterine size, yes that has come sometimes in your INI CT exam, uterine size is bigger, is bigger than pregnancy duration. Uterine size is bigger than the pregnancy duration, okay. So, suppose the pregnancy is around 8 weeks, then when you do the uh, uh, per abdominal examination at you know generally at 8 weeks the pregnancy size of a small orange, I mean the uterine size is that size of an orange, if you do a per vaginal examination you will feel the uterus to be the size of an orange. But in a, um, a complete mole the same pregnancy might be around 20 centimeters in size or even 30 centimeters in size sometimes. So, uterine size is much bigger than the period of gestation, bleeding PV and uh, they can be also uh, hypertension, hyperemesis, gravidarium, thyrotoxicosis because of the high HCG, uh, hypertension which I said is early onset hypertension. So, those are peculiar things which you see in this one, okay. What is the treatment of cervical cancer 3A? Now, cervical cancer please remember uh, the staging, you know there are two cancers CA breast and CA cervix, Indian women these are the two common malignancies. So, be careful when they ask you about uh, tumours, most common tumours of women please be careful, tumours if they ask you for women anywhere in the world and including India the most common tumour of women is fibroid uterus. If they ask you most common malignancy of women especially in India then it is CA breast and then CA cervix. So, these three things please read and go, CA breast, CA cervix and fibroids when you are reading about women. Of course, CA breast has been taken wonderfully uh, for you guys by the surgery faculty of prep ladder Dr. Pratesh, but then you should always read about CA breast completely and CA cervix, the staging wise treatment also and the staging completely. The common Indian cancers you should know the stagings are poor, like sometimes you are confused about CA vulva staging and even about CA endometrium staging. Uh, you know CA endometrium they will ask you more about the symptoms, they will ask you about the presentations, but CA cervix they can ask you stagings and they can ask you stage wise treatment sometimes, but uh, not very commonly uh, about the stage wise treatment. They can ask you the basic about advanced cancer treatment, so let me help you with that. So, if a person is having CA cervix, so stage 1 to 2A1, 
then in this stage we can do a radical hysterectomy. But after stage after equal to stage 2 A 2 we will not be able to give a complete treatment by radical hysterectomy. See this radical hysterectomy mostly in India we do the Wertheim's Wertheim's radical hysterectomy which is type 2 hysterectomy. You know the simple hysterectomy which we do the place where we just open the abdomen and go very close to the uterus take out the ligaments take out the uterine arteries and just the upper part of the vagina that is known as a simple hysterectomy. So type 2 hysterectomy is a radical hysterectomy by Wertheim's and type 3 hysterectomy is the radical hysterectomy by, by Meigs. So the radical hysterectomy by Meigs is even more extensive. So mostly in India we do the Wertheim's hysterectomy, the radical hysterectomy. Radical means you take out the ligaments, half of them in Wertheim's and you take out the lymph nodes, the draining lymph nodes of the cervix like the internal iliac and the external iliac, the obturator, the uh, presacral, all these lymph nodes also will take out. So that is a radical hysterectomy. So stage 1, taking out the uterus, taking out the tissues is enough treatment, but if it is stage 2A1 till that time this is enough but if it is beyond stage 2A2 that means the growth has become 4 centimeters and bigger and it is now going into the uh, you know the uh, parametrium a little bit so then your surgical management is not enough. So we do not do surgery please do not misunderstand I am saying in stage 2A2 you give chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. So it is basically called chemo radiation, chemo radiation, chemotherapy and radiotherapy together is known as chemo radiation and that indeed is the best treatment of any cancer which of CA service which is beyond uh, with is 2A2 and beyond because surgically you cannot do a complete, a, a complete clearance of this cancer. You must give chemotherapy and radiotherapy together. It is very toxic chemotherapy alone and radiotherapy alone is quite toxic and together they will be compounding their actions. But that is what is the uh, idea behind the management that both of these given together in a particular regime are going to give more than 50 percent survival of these uh, advanced cancer stages patients also. All right. So please remember the most common stage which they ask you in the exam is stage 3. And in that also stage 3B, in this question they have given stage 3A. Why stage 3B? Because stage 3B is the most common stage, it is the most common stage of presentation, I am writing presentation, CA cervix, CA cervix, patients with CA cervix will be sitting at home rotting with the cancer, foul smelling discharge, pain, everything. But they will not complain till one day the growth goes till the pelvic side wall. Stage 3B is growth going till the pelvic side wall. The bones get involved with the cancer and that causes severe pain because that severe pain no woman will sit at home. So most common stage with which a woman presents to the OPD is stage 3B and that is why they ask you stage 3B the most. What is the management of stage 3B? So anything beyond 2A2 is best managed by 2A2 and beyond rather by chemo radiation okay okay involving one no uh, now what is this um, inguinal lymph node mcq yes ca cervix does not drain CA cervix does not drain in the inguinal group of lymph nodes, cervix does not drain in the inguinal group of lymph nodes, alright. So uh, I can quickly give you uh, information which is important. If you look at the uterus, see, if you look at the uterus in the pelvis, quick diagram here and the ovaries here and this is the pelvis. So if you see this the lymphatics from the uterus, see this is the uterus, upper part of the uterus and from the ovary, these are the lymphatics. They will go along the round ligament, see the white lines are the 
fallopian tubes these are the round ligaments the round ligaments will go up to the labia major i have shown you always with my hands that the round ligaments go from the fundus suppose my my uh, shoulders are the fundus of the uterus and these are round ligaments they go from the top of the uterus and go through the inguinal canal and go and hold the labia majora in front so these round ligaments will go till the labia majora through the inguinal canal now along with the round ligaments these lymphatics will move these lymphatics will move along the round ligaments like this okay and come to the labia majora so that's why the lymphatics from the top of the uterus and also from the ovary can go to the inguinal uh, lymph nodes so stage 4b of ca endometrium stage 4b of ca ovary will have inguinal group of lymph nodes so inguinal group of lymph nodes will be there in stage 4b of ca endometrium and of ca ovary ca cervix like somebody asked me here in the uh, the chat ca cervix does not involve the inguinal group of lymph nodes this is your anatomy question also and also your uh, gynec question so cervix does not drain okay the cervix goes to the local lymph nodes here okay all the lymph nodes here the interiliac the extrailiac the presacral and the para uterine all these lymph uh, you know the lymphatics but not the inguinal group of lymph nodes so i think that does this question we discuss a lot more okay a 6 year old woman with uterus protruding out 10 cm which of the following is the best treatment i mean the 6 year old woman 10 cm uterus coming out that means it's looking like uh, you know the complete the posterior vaginal length is 9 cm so if it is 10 cm means with the stretch of the vagina also everything has now everted out of the vagina so it's a 6 year old woman so what is the best treatment you going to do for her best treatment so pessary treatment is going to give temporary relief pessary treatment is going to give a temporary relief but the best treatment is vaginal hysterectomy now what is leford's partial colpoclesis so try and understand if the uterus is coming out i'll try to show with you my hand see here see this now this is the uterus this is the vagina so what happens the uterus comes out of the vagina like this and when it comes out like this you can do the hysterectomy here but when a woman is a very very old debilitated woman she cannot withstand a major surgery so what do you do rather than doing a major surgery you just take her to the minor ot push the uterus back inside and partly close the vagina we just make a band of tissues we pull the anterior vagina and posterior vagina and make a band so yes this is how the vaginal opening is and through is the cervix is coming out so i'm showing you like this see this is this i'm showing you this picture this is the opening of the vagina and this is the cervix which is coming out so what do we do i take some tissues from the top of the vagina and from the posterior vagina and tie them like this so this band of tissue there's a band of tissue which is made so that the uterus will hit this band and not come out so that is just a very simple temporary surgery leford's partial colpo colpo means vagina colpoclesis so if you see this if i show you like this see this is the vaginal opening so what do we do we make it a double barrel vagina the vaginal opening we make it a double barrel vagina okay so that is partial colpoclesis but that's not the best treatment again it is temporary treatment so the best treatment is basically the vaginal hysterectomy with the pelvic floor repair so that is the best treatment because if a woman can withstand surgery she is surgically fit then we can go ahead and do the vaginal hysterectomy now suppose a woman comes to me uh, you know in the opd and she says sir i'm not able to pass urine my uterus is outside and every time uh, my urination is uh, difficult i have to push my uterus back to start urinating that is a typical complaint of prolapse so this kind of woman for temporary relief you know i have to send a blood investigations i have to get a cardiac clearance i have to get a sugars clearance i have to get a chest x ray and so many things and if there's a decubitus ulcer then i have to make sure that ulcer heals so paps i mean uh, paps smear and all also have to be done so if the uterus is if you look at this picture which i'm showing you here see the uterus is having some lot of congestion on the uh, on the cervix so first i will make her physically fit reduce the edema in the uterus and then only go ahead and do the surgery so meanwhile what you can do meanwhile we can push the uterus back inside and hold it with the pessary so pessary treatment if i try to show you with the diagram here this is the uterus and this is the bladder in front 
this is the rectum. So, we put a pessary here, put a pessary here. So, when you put the pessary inside, how do you know the pessary is adequate? This question has been uh, uh, running around a lot in the discussion forums. So, you know the pessary is adequate that once you push the pessary inside and then the woman strains, then the uterus should not come out. On straining, the uterus does not come out. That means the pessary is adequately placed. Also, number two, she should not have too much of pain after the placement of pessary. All right. I am not writing all of that. I am sure that you can all uh, uh, rewind and listen to this so that you do not have a problem in uh, you know uh, remembering the facts. So, one that uh, there should be no pain when the pessary is placed, you should give the right size and number two when she strains the uterus should not come out. That is what is a good temporary treatment, but the best treatment is vaginal hysterectomy and a pelvic floor repair. So, yes we must understand the floor of the pelvis that is what is weak in prolapse. So, if you see this lady here and this the uterus which has come out from here. Now, this part from where it has come out, I will do a hysterectomy here. So, it is a very easy thing to do a hysterectomy that is the basic thing we can just take it off, but the pelvic floor has to be closed. There was a floor through which the uterus came out the muscle flow. So, if you understand what I am trying to say this is a defect in the pelvic flow. If you see this pelvic outlet, this is the sacrum and this is the pubic symphysis here, this is anterior, this is posterior. So, this is the vaginal opening and this is the anal opening all right. So, they are muscles that there is the pubo rectalis muscle here and then the pubo coccygeus muscle like this and then the iliococcygeus muscle like this. See these are the three muscles the pubo rectalis and the pubo coccygeus and the iliococcygeus. These three muscles known as the levator ani. So, this levator ani is the best floor, best uh, support, the pelvic floor or the levator ani is the best support of the uterus. Now, this best support of the uterus, this is weakened when the uterus comes out. Because of this weakening, the uterus comes out. Pelvic floor is the best support of the uterus. Repeatedly, I have told this, do not say ligaments are the best support. Ligaments are good support. Out of the ligaments, mechanod ligaments is the best ligamentous support. But overall best support is the pelvic floor. Now, this pelvic floor is totally weakened when the uterus goes out. So, when the uterus goes out, you cut the uterus, you do a hysterectomy, but repair the floor, pelvic floor repair. This vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair, this surgery which I have shown you goes by a regular name in the moment you become interns, you will be, yes, you will be all becoming interns, right? Another six months you will be doing internship, all right? Keep that confidence. So, when you are doing internship, we will be making you post our list, you know OT list, that is interns job most of the times of first APG. So, you will go, we will write the list, we will tell you so many patients are posted tomorrow and there are two vaginal hysterectomies. So, what is that known as? That surgery is known as ward mayos. So, you will be making the list and you will write that okay, there are two ward mayos tomorrow, we should be at least going and seeing them or if you are lucky, we can even assist them as the second assistant in the surgery. But that will happen towards the end of your internship when you see many ward mayos and then you are assisting properly and then we will make you assist. And uh, if you are smart enough, then we will make you do a lot of abdominal closures, even uterine closures. Some interns have done um, cesareans, but uh, I am not saying that on record. We will cut this off, all right. <laughs> but then the ones who are working very hard, okay. Internship is a lovely time. I am sure you all very excited to write this exam and come and do internship in the colleges. So, we are waiting, we are waiting to welcome all of you for that. So, that is uh, vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair and uh, partial colpoclesis I told you. I think we can move on. If you have some questions, I can look up. Pessary, use for pessary. Yep, in pregnancy also you can give, but even when a person, uh, Bhavesh, yes, even when a person is unfit for a surgery that uh, you know pessary treatment can be given in pregnancy, but a person is not fit for a surgery, she will probably not withstand the surgery if uh, we do a major procedure, all right. So, she is unfit then also we can give pessary treatment. Okay, fine, I think uh, that is more than done, let us move on. A pregnant woman at 37 weeks of gestation brought to the emergency with pain abdomen and hypotension, hypotension guys please note 37 weeks hypotension. 
On examination there was abdominal tenderness, fetal parts were felt superficially in the abdomen that is I mean when you put your hand on the abdomen of a pregnant lady you will feel the uterus and through the uterus you can feel the parts uh, not so easily you know, but if the uterus is ruptured then the baby is outside the uterus in just underneath the abdominal wall then you can feel the fetal parts much easier. So, fetal parts were felt superficially and fetal heart rate was not heard what could be the probable diagnosis. So, please the only thing the answer here can be is rupture uterus and some of you are thinking of abruption that is not the answer. Look abdominal tenderness in pregnancy all of you have a problem saying it is abruption. It is not a wrong thing, but abruption will always be given along with hypertension. Hypertension, high blood pressure can cause abruption most commonly. Most common cause of abruption is hypertension pregnancy. So, if you are having a tender uterus and a blood pressure let us say 170 by 120 and bleeding per vaginum and headache, so that is abruption with immune eclampsia sometimes you will get. So, you will get abruption along with hypertension. This is not abruption, okay. This is a straightforward case of a ruptured uterus, alright. So, easily felt uh, fetal parts and loss of uterine contour and the patient will uh, be in shock and the fetal heart rate will not be heard, okay. So, answer is ruptured uterus. So, yeah, most of you got correct. C, intrauterine fetal death, yes, of course it is. Uh, maybe the choice is not so good, yeah. You are not wrong in answering that, Bhavesh. Yeah, it is intrauterine fetal death, correct. Fetal heart rate is not heard. So, why it is not intrauterine fetal death? Yes, I know the choice could have been better. You know, I have just recalled these questions from what were there in your uh, guidebooks and also what was there on the uh, prep ladder forum on the uh, on the uh, YouTube. So, yes, the choice could have been better. I agree with you. But this is a straightforward case of rupture uterus, okay. Of course, there is a uh, of course, there is a patient who has got a fetal death, that is right. Of course, it can also be because of uh, obstructed labor, obstructed labor can cause a ruptured uterus. Yes, in a primary gravida it can cause, in a multi gravida it can cause more rupture uterus if there is an obstruction. In a primary gravida she can go into inertia, in a multi gravida she can rupture the uterus. Some outright basics, right, Chalo. Okay, what else are you guys saying? Hmm. Yeah, but that is not, the IUD is not the best answer, please go with rupture uterus, okay. Okay. During a speckle examination of woman in the gynecology OPD, the cervix appeared congested. On doing a pap smear, the cervix started to bleed a bit. What could be the most probable organism to cause these changes? So, they are saying that the cervix is congested. See, look at this cervix. See, this cervix is looking congested to me. And if there is a congested cervix like this, this congested cervix, if you do a pap smear, as it is cervix is a soft organ and if you do a pap smear, Please do not rotate many times, one turn of 360 degrees and take the IR spatula away or if you are using a let us say a cyto brush then also you should do one turn of 360 degrees. So, you go inside and you start scraping on a normal cervix is going to bleed if you do too many times you are scraping with the IR spatula. But this cervix which is congested will uh, even start bleeding. So, this congested cervix, this erosion on the cervix can be because of which organism. So, most common organism all of you know is the human papilloma virus, alright. So, HPV uh, you know first it will cause this erosions and it may before a obvious erosion it will also show us uh, microscopically on the pap smear it will show me some changes like CI in 1 cervical intraepithelial neoplasia only in the epithelium when I do the pap smear just the epithelium has new cells intraepithelial, okay. Do not think that when the surface cells are a little bit bad, it does not straight away mean a cancer. Intraepithelial, okay. In the epithelium of the cervix, when I do a pap smear, I see abnormal cells, then I call it cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. When they start invading into the stroma, you know, from the epithelium, they start invading into the tissue of the cervix, then I can confirm. I take a biopsy and I see some cells from the epithelium are going into the cervical tissues, then it becomes an invasive cancer of the cervix. Alright, so the answer for this one is HPV 16. I hope you are reading about the vaccine. The vaccine for HPV is Gardasil, this is the one which is coming in exam. Gardasil is given in a dose, I mean 3 doses are given. So, 1 on day 0 and then on, on uh, the in the second month after that date 
and then on the sixth month. We are nowadays having the Gardasil 9, that is why we call it a non-avalent vaccine. It is active against uh, 16 serotypes, alright. So, I am sure that you have been reading about this uh, against 9 serotypes, did I say 16? So, against 9 serotypes, not 16 guys, against 9 serotypes, Gardasil 9, it is a non-avalent vaccine. So, um, you must know the serotypes also. Uh, I am known to muddle it up a little bit here. Let me try once more. So, 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, 58. I am not even trying to claim that I remember them. These are 9, yes, these are 9. So, I do not even claim that I know them very well because I am not very a big fan of this vaccine. So, I have said this uh, on a few forums earlier. But then yes, it is something better than nothing. So, that is why you know it is uh, uh, CA service can happen because of at least uh, 50 serotypes. There are 50 serotypes or more which can cause CA cervix and this vaccine is useful against 9 serotypes. So, that is why it is not short short prevention. Please remember that all of you whom, whom you are going to uh, all of you those who are going to give this vaccine to your friends and to your uh, people who are you know about to start a married life and those who are. Uh, having cousins who are sexually active. So, those people who are planning to give this vaccine, please tell your patients or your friends that it will prevent against 9 serotypes, but there are many other serotypes which cause CA cervix. So, the screening for CA cervix will continue in spite of giving the Gardasil vaccine. The screening for CA cervix with the pap smear will continue. Okay? So, giving the vaccine is no surety that she will never have a cancer. Please remember this basic because it is active against only 9 major high risk serotypes, not against all the serotypes. Okay? That is why I am not a very big fan of this one. But then yes, like I said, something better than nothing. Chali, aage badte hai. And uh, somebody is saying that uh, Chandan Gauda, that um, uh, Cervarix is uh, active against only 2 serotypes. So, Gardasil is much better. And uh, if a lady is already sexually active, so if a person is already exposed, I am not saying that uh, you know if she is sexually active then she is likely exposed we say. Uh, it is not a, not a given that she is exposed to an infected man, but when she is already exposed then the protection is only 40 percent. When a person has never been exposed and she takes the vaccine prophylactically, it is 90 percent effective in reducing CA cervix. Again, again remember it is 90 percent likely to reduce CA cervix if the patient is not exposed only against these 9 serotypes. So, that is what I am trying to say. If you give it before the sexual activity starts, 90 percent prevention. If the sexual activity is already started and there is HPV probably gone in, then the protection is only 40 percent. But this 90 and 40 is only against these 9 serotypes which I mentioned, not against CA cervix completely. Okay? Please remember that. So, uh, Ram Kumar has asked me a question, HPV 16 is more common, HPV 18 is more malignant, alright. So, common is 16, malignant is 18. Now, during an antenatal visit of a pregnant lady of 20 weeks, the fundal height is only 16 weeks. The pregnancy is 20 weeks, but the height of the uterus is smaller, 16 weeks. An ultrasound done shows no amniotic fluid, an amnios, an amnios we call it or an hadramnios. That means there is no lyca. So, anamnios or anhydramnios, like we say, which abnormality is the likely cause? So, all of us know that a fetus um, is the major contributor to the amniotic fluid after the 14 15 weeks. After 14 15 weeks, the urine is the major contribution to the amniotic fluid. The fetal kidney should be working. So, if that is not working properly, then there will be lyca, which will be less. So, the best answer to this one is renal abnormalities. So, most of you got that correct. Anencephaly, gastrochiasis, esophageal atresia, all of these cause polyhydramnios. Okay? Okay. Fine. So, when we say oligoamnios, see the lyca amount might as well do this revision with you guys. So, around 40 weeks the lyca is around 600 ml and around 32 to 34 weeks the lyca is around 1000 ml and at 36 weeks it is around 
800 ml. So, please the liker is maximum at around 32 to 34 weeks. If they ask you one of these like they asked you in December 21 exam, they did not give you uh, the choices as 32 and 34, they gave you 28, 32, 36 and 40 weeks. So, please we all went ahead and marked 32 at that time. Do not say liker is maximum at 40 weeks, that is a wrong answer. Liker is maximum around 32 to 34 weeks and then the liker starts reducing. That is why when the liker starts reducing at 35, 36 weeks, then we do external cephalic version, external cephalic version. If I want to turn a baby from a breech to a cephalic, if I want to turn a baby from a breech to a cephalic, then I will do at this 36 weeks because that is the time when the liker is now reducing and the baby is becoming bigger. So, this is the basis that liker is reducing that is why I can do external cephalic version at 36 weeks. So, at least by this logic you should remember liker is higher before 36 weeks and after 30 to 34 weeks at 36 weeks onwards it starts reducing okay and 40 weeks it is still lesser. I hope you do not have any confusion that okay external cephalic version external podalic version kuch nahi hota hai. Uh, gaming mafia, there is nothing called external podalic version, there is something called internal podalic version. So, if you really want to know internal podalic version IPV is done only in second of twin with transverse lie, second of twin with transverse lie, there is nothing called an external podalic version. Externally, we always try to get the head down. So, if a baby is in breach, breach delivery will cause more problems. So, we always do external cephalic version, there is nothing called ex because breach is not a favorable delivery. Although I can do, all of us senior doctors can do breach vaginal delivery, but we would prefer to do a cephalic delivery. So, breach ko ghuma ke, we turn the breach and get the head down, external cephalic version. But when a patient has already delivered one baby, the second baby is in transverse lie, then internally you put your hand and turn the baby so that we can get the legs down easily. We cannot go inside the uterus and hold the head, holding the head is going to be difficult. So, there we do the internal podalic version, holding the legs is easy and then by the head, by the legs will be when we pull the baby out that is known as a breech extraction. So, yes, then it is known as an internal podalic version. Okay? So, since you asked me, I told you this part. It is a very interesting class of breach whenever you want. We can take another session for that, is not it? So, uh, five uh, step hota hai. All right, thanks for your comments, guys. Um, okay. What are C contra? Indication show ECV. Why, when you do not want to do a ECV, of course, when the patient is in early labor, you will not do it beyond uh, the time when the, the patient is having of uh, you know uh, early labor that is 37, 38 weeks UTC retable, we do not do. When the baby is anomalous, we do not do. Okay? And uh, when there is a short cord, we do not do. Ba patient has a severe hypertension, then turning the baby can cause an abruption. All right. So, uh, all these conditions we will not do, external cephalic version. A 24 year old primary graduate 30 weeks has blood pressure 160 by 110 which is very high. The lab workup shows increased SGPT, SGOT and LDH and there is also low platelets. Which of the following is the most probable diagnosis? I mean the questions cannot get easier than this. Okay. So, the person is having hypertension. So, remember hypertension in pregnancy is the situation which can lead on to something called the HELP syndrome. Okay? HELP syndrome is not seen in men, it is not seen in children, it is always seen in women with, I mean it is seen only in women with hypertension, not always I am sorry, it is seen with women with hypertension. One of the complications, not all women with hypertension will go into HELP syndrome because after HELP syndrome they can go into DIC. So, HELP syndrome is not good, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a diagnosis peculiar to pregnant ladies with hypertension in pregnancy. All right? So, HELP syndrome, these are the things and the, sometimes PG entrance exam they will ask you evidence of hemolysis. All right? Schistocytes you will see on the peripheral smear and also you will see um, increase in LDH. So, all those things that you may see. 
Okay. So, let us not get uh, uh, you, this is a very simple question. Uh, this question may come also with abruption because there is high blood pressure and bleeding per vaginum. So, abruption also might be one of the answers. Okay. A woman with a, a prosthetic valve on warfarin treatment for anticoagulation, anticoagulation is now planning a pregnancy. What is advice given to her in regard to anticoagulation management? So, whenever warfarin is given, you know, warfarin embryopathy, you know, uh, that is something which uh, aplasia cutis and all that uh, facial defects. So, uh, warfarin embryopathy compels us that in the first trimester when the uh, organogenesis is taking place, at that time warfarin should not be given. So, if a woman is contemplating pregnancy, then we switch her over to heparin. Low molecular weight heparin is a good alternative. So, give her low molecular weight heparin in the first trimester. After the first trimester, we, she can go back to warfarin because organogenesis is complete. So, yes, first trimester, first trimester this woman gets uh, heparin, low molecular weight heparin and after 12 weeks, she is put back on back to warfarin and after 34, 36 weeks when she is about to deliver switch again over this was PG entrance question switch again to low molecular weight heparin. So, we start the pregnancy with low, mo low molecular weight heparin, then after 12 weeks we shift her to warfarin and remember that uh, warfarin has a much higher half life. So, if you continue giving warfarin and she goes into labor, then you cannot, you will have to give an antidote for warfarin otherwise she will uh, go on bleeding during her labor. So, we stop heparin around 36 weeks and now again switch over to low molecular weight heparin. So, when you give low molecular weight heparin, the half life is only around 6 hours. So, Suppose today you are planning to induce labor, uh, then yesterday I would have given the last dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin and today I can induce labor. Let us say it is 39 weeks I am planning to induce for whatever reason, then just one day before, I am trying to do a cesarean, just one day before you stop, I mean one day before you do not give the heparin and she will be fine when you do the surgery today. Or uh, some people say that you give the day before, on the day of surgery you just withhold the heparin, that is also one protocol that if you just because the half life is only 6 hours. Generally what we do is that if tomorrow is the surgery, today we do not give the, today is uh, low molecular weight heparin we hold, then tomorrow we do the surgery and day after we can start the low molecular weight heparin again. All right. So, uh, a 52 year old lady with 16 months of amenorrhea, what is the test result would you expect? So, when a woman is going into menopause, all of you know, then the gonadotropins, the brain is, the ovaries uh, getting old, the brain is still young. So, when the ovaries are getting old, the ovaries do not make estrogen. So, yes, uh, I always uh, go back to this favorite diagram of mine that you know that the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary by the GnRH and the pituitary makes the FSH and pituitary that will make the follicle grow, it will make the estrogen which will give proliferation of the endometrium and then this high estrogen gives a feedback to the brain to release the LH and the LH surge causes the rupture of the follicle to make progesterone which makes the endometrium secretory and this estrogen gives a negative feedback for the FSH and this progesterone gives a negative feedback for the this progesterone gives a negative feedback for the LH. So, basically what happens all of us know that the FSH is for the production of estrogens and LH is for the production of progesterones in a woman, we know this much. So, if a woman is having an ovary which is not working, look here this ovary, this ovary is not working. So, then there is no estrogen, there is no progesterone. When there is no estrogen and no progesterone, so this feedback is not there. So, this gonadotropin will increase and FSH and LH will increase, that is the basic logic. You must understand that the pituitary releases FSH and acts on the ovary to make a lot of estrogens. If the ovary is not working, there is no estrogen, no feedback to the brain. So, brain goes on stimulating the ovary. 
So around 50 years, the woman's ovary, a woman's ovary stops working. There are no follicles left. So there's no estrogen, there's no progesterone in the ovary left anymore. So when uh, there's no estrogen, there's no progesterone, no feedback to the brain. Brain is always young. Brain will increase the LH and brain will increase the FSH. So that's how we know high LH and high FSH is the answer to this question. That's right. Okay. A patient uh, presented with bleeding per vaginum in labor and a tender tense abdomen on palpation. Okay, she is having bleeding per vaginum in pregnancy and uh, she is having a tender uterus. Her blood pressure is high. So, high blood pressure and a tender uterus. So, we already know the, uh, uh, the question is suggesting abruption. So, cervical dilatation is 5 cm and full effacement is present. Fetal heart rate is 144 per minute with adequate bed rest, uh, beat to beat, I am so sorry, with adequate beat to beat variability. What is the likely diagnosis? So, this is a case of abruptio placentae because see, there is no Please remember, there is no uh, fetal distress. So, abruptio placentae. I am trying to tell you here that whenever there is bleeding per vaginum, there are two things we should keep in mind. One is placenta previa and one is abruption. Placenta previa is because of a large placenta or two placentas like in twins and it is covering the os and the bleeding will be there which will be painless. In abruptio placenta, bleeding is painful because there is also bruising in the uterus. The uterine muscle has some uh, bruises, some hematomas in the uterine muscle. That is why we call it a covalent uterus, is not it? If you see the uterus, so there is this retroplacental blood. This is called a concealed bleed. And the blood may also come out like this, we call it a revealed bleed or it may bleed into the uterine muscle. That is what is known as a covular uterus, covular uterus. They will ask you this, where do you see covular uterus? Covular uterus you see in a abruption. So, this is basically a bruised uterus, the covular uterus. That is why it is painful. See, all of you know that uh, uh, plasma previa has painless bleeding and abruption has painful bleeding. Why is it painful? because of this covalent, this bruising in the uterine muscle. So, uh, whenever there is hypertension and tender uterus and bleeding per vaginum, think of abruptio placentae. That is a simple one. Any questions you have been asking me or you are just answering guys? Okay, fine. That is the answers then. A patient had history of severe heart disease and now she presented with the large fibroid. Anesthesiologists classified her as a moderate risk. What procedure is not to be performed? The patient has a fibroid and she has to undergo a hysterectomy. Whether they do a, a abdominal hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy, any of these hysterectomies can be done. But what should not be done? So, when a person has heart disease, then we know that we do not do a laparoscopic hysterectomy. We can do vaginal, we can do abdominal, we can do subtotal. Nobody does subtotal these days, but that is a type of hysterectomy. I mean, any type of hysterectomy you can do. But to do it laparoscopy, when the abdomen gets distended with the carbon dioxide, that can cause the tenting of the diaphragm. So, the respiratory capacity reduces and that patient can go into pulmonary edema because the patient has got a weak heart also. So, moment you do a laparoscopic hysterectomy, what are we doing mostly? The patient is not straight like this. You know, I put the laparoscope inside, then mostly what we do to see the uterus, the bowel will be sitting on the uterus, all of that small bowel will be there. So, what we do? Put the patient's head low, head low position, it is called the Trendelenburg. So, see this, uh, oh, that position is, that picture is missing. So, when the patient is having the uh, head low and the legs up, so both the legs, both the legs, one le liter in uh, right and one liter in the left, both the legs, the blood will be going back into the circulation towards the heart. So heart is as it is weak in a case of heart disease and we tend to give a lot of Trendelenburg position when we are doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy. So all of that excess blood and then the tenting of the uh, uh, diaphragm and the pulmonary capacity is being reduced, that can push the patient to have a cardiac failure and a pulmonary edema. Also what happens because of this um, distension of the abdomen, there is there is increase in the systemic vascular resistance and there is also 
the right atrial pressures will also increase. That is what leads, leads the patient to have pulmonary edema. So, increase in the systemic vascular resistance and the right atrial pressure will cause the patient to have pulmonary edema. Also, reduction in the cardiac index and the left ventricular stroke volume. So, these are the uh, hardcore facts which anesthesia books will give you. And uh, remember, that is why it is preferable that a patient who has got a heart lesion that we do either a very quick laparoscopic hysterectomy which some of us can do, not all of us, but uh, I am I'm not very comfortable doing a laparoscopic hysterectomy. I rather do a aram say open hysterectomy rather than doing a heroic laparoscopic hysterectomy which can sometimes take up to 2 hours also. So, uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy requires a lot of skill and uh, we should do it only when uh, a per person is in a perfect state to get it done. So, laparoscopic hysterectomy is more cosmetic. Uh, you know, yes, of course, there are many other benefits, but yes, easy recovery also of the patient. Patient can go home within the next day, but all said and done. All right, uh, I hope you can. Some. All right, uh, there was some uh, buffering which I saw. So, identify the image identify the image. Yeah, you know, since it is a gynae class and uh, this is a parasite which is coming from the and uh, this looks like uh, the parasite which I know, you know, this looks like a flagellate uh, trophos protozoa, it looks like a flagellate protozoa and a flagellate protozoa in my specialty is a trachomoniasis. So, I am sure the question would have been much uh, more detailed, you know, a woman having uh, severe itching in the vagina with greenish yellow profuse discharge and a smear made out of the discharge showed motile organisms in the microscopy which look like this. What are these organisms? So, this should have been the ideal question. So, yes, all of you know this is trachomoniasis and trachomoniasis causes the strawberry vagina. Already I have given you the chart, so let us not waste much time on this. Let us move on and see next question. What is the first sign of magnesium sulphate toxicity? Please remember magnesium sulphate, magnesium sulphate is given in grams. All of you have a problem of writing in milligrams. So, we give 4 grams IV and then we give 10 grams IM. So, 14 grams is the loading dose for stopping the convulsion. So, when we give this 14 grams, 4 to 7 milli equivalents per liter is the thera, excuse me, therapeutic level. Now, if it is more than 8 to 10 milli equivalents, that reduces knee jerks, all right. So, that is the first sign of magnesium sulphate toxicity, loss of deep tendon reflexes. So, magnesium sulphate is a central suppressant, central uh, cerebral suppressant. So, that will cause the, uh, you all know that the knee jerk is a upper motor neuron reflex. So, moment there is a suppression in the brain, then the deep tendon reflexes like the knee jerks will get suppressed. So, when that is suppressed, we know that there is too much of magnesium sulphate in the circulation. So, whenever you have to give max self, you know after giving the 14 grams loading, you have to next give 5 grams IM 4 hourly uh, till the patient delivers and even 24 hours after the delivery, you have to give the magnesium sulphate. So, when you give this much of magnesium sulphate, please remember this max self has to be monitored. So, you cannot give magnesium sulphate without monitoring. So, what do you monitor? You monitor the knee jerks, knee jerks respiratory rate and the urine output. So, when we give knee jerks, knee jerks are if they are uh, they should be present and the respiratory rate should be more than 14 per minute and urine output should be more than 100 in the last 100 ml in the last 4 hours. So, when you are giving the magnesium sulphate after the initial dose, we have to give it 5 grams 4 hourly. So, when you are giving this, always check, always check the patient's parameters like these three, of course, blood pressure and respiratory rate, all that also you will check, conscious levels, all that also you will check. But these three will determine whether you can give the max self or not. If there is knee jerks absent, we hold the max self. If the respiratory rate is less than 14, we hold the max self. And if the output is not good, because 
magnesium sulfate has a renal excretion, max self has renal excretion. So, output should be at least more than 100 ml in the last 4 hours. So, the first sign of toxicity is loss of deep tendon reflexes and next is respiratory depression and next is respiratory arrest and more than 25 milli equivalents, more than 25 milli equivalents is cardiac arrest. What is the antidote? Yes. What is the antidote of magnesium sulphate toxicity? Let me put that to the forum, all right. Let us see uh, how many of you are going to answer this one, 200 of you roughly seeing this. Come on, let us see what you are going to answer. Mm, the answer is not coming. What gluconate Rator? Calcium gluconate, all right. Yes, calcium gluconate. So, calcium gluconate when you give, you give calcium gluconate to give 1000 milligrams in 10 ml over 10 minutes, 10 ml in 10 minutes intravenously, okay. 1000 milligrams in 10 ml, that is 1 gram that is, okay. Uh, which is a 10 ml uh, liquid, which is given over 10 minutes, it is given intravenously. That is why we keep asking you about this one. Okay. Then let us see a 29 year old nulliparous lady presented with endometriosis and infertility. On laparoscopy, there were severe pelvic adhesions and the uterus had a bubble stuck to its fundus with dense adhesions. Okay, 29 year old nulliparous and infertility with endometriosis. The ovaries were cystic each around 6 to 8 centimeters in size and are stuck to each other. When the ovaries are stuck to each other, we call them kissing ovaries, especially in endometriosis because they will be big and they will be stuck to each other in the pouch of Douglas. What is the next line of management? So, when a patient is 29 year old and she wants a treatment for infertility, obviously you cannot say hysterectomy, nophorectomy. She is a young lady, she needs to have uh, her whole, uh, you know, another good 22, 23 years of her menstrual life is left. You cannot take out her uterus, cannot take out her ovaries. Now, with an endometriotic cyst and which is around 6 to 8 centimeter, uh, the ovaries are cystic, that means both ways cystic. So, we can go ahead and remove these cysts, okay. Debulking of this, primary debulking, suppression for some time with GnRH is going to give a clean pelvis and that is very good for getting a pregnancy. So, in endometriosis try to take out bulk of the disease and limit the endometriosis. Limiting the endometriosis is known to give pregnancies. So, endometriosis is an indication for IUI and also a lot of endometriosis patients end up in in vitro fertilization also. But yes, first I will do the debulking of the disease. Remember, she can always have recurrence. So, we will do a surgical correction, surgical removal of disease, surgical removal and then medical suppression of endometriosis. Medical suppression is of course, your GnRH in a logs, one of those suppression methods and after that you can give her a choice. She can be trying a pregnancy or she can be on combined oral contraceptive pills. So, surgical removal like the answer here, bilateral cystectomy, adesiolysis, prepare for IVF. Yes, because the anatomy is very destroyed and uh, that is why uh, you know the tubes are probably stuck in adhesions because the bowel is also stuck, they are bilateral cysts. So, there will be a lot of adhesions. So, debulk the disease, suppress her for some time and after that she should be pregnant which we can do with IVF. If she already has children, then she could be on combined pills. Endometriosis patient should not menstruate without supervision. That is why I always say, tell my PGs, this is how I te teach them, that if she goes on menstruating uh, over 2 years, 3 years, she will again have a recurrence of endometriosis. What is the recurrence of endometriosis? That is your MCQ. Yes, anybody, um, so many of you are here, yeah, who is going to tell me, what is the recurrence rate of endometriosis? Screen is not visible. Kuch problem hai kya dekhe? Is there a uh, guys? I'm um, having all of that in front of me. 
and uh, we are relaying it from my studio at home and uh, we have perfect uh, transmission from here. So, if some of you are not able to see it, then uh, I think you will have to check it at your end and uh, my team is anyway seeing things as we are uh, doing this. All right. So, what is the recurrence rate of endometriosis? 2 to 4 percent, 90 percent. <laughs> oh God. Screen is fine, somebody says. Okay, fine. If the screen is fine. Recurrence rate of endometriosis, please. Retrograde menstruation, which is the cause of endometriosis, that retrograde menstruation is seen in 90 percent of women and out of those 90 percent, 10 of those, you know, roughly around 10 percent of women in the world have endometriosis. So, retrograde menstruation happens in 90 percent of women, 10 of those women will have, 10 percent of women in the world have endometriosis. So, that 90 percent I think came from there, that is the retrograde menstruation. After you do the treatment which I am telling you, after you do the treatment, the recurrence rate is 60 to 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent is the recurrence of endometriosis. So, it is the biggest, biggest problem, biggest problem of a gynecologist is the recurrence of endometriosis. That is why we keep saying that a, a, a woman with endometriosis should not be menstruating uh, without uh, supervision. You know, she should be having menstruation uh, limited in amount or no menstruation at all so that the disease is controlled medically. So, surgical removal and medical suppression, okay. Quick revision we had of endometriosis. Okay, in the graph of menstrual cycle, which alphabet shown is suggestive of ovulation? So, um, the uh, choices are A, B, O, N, M, that is the alphabets, all right. So, if you see the alphabet A, this is showing the increase in the estrogen. Alphabet B, after ovulation, it is increasing, that is progesterone. So, follicular phase has estrogen, luteal phase has progesterone, and this is going to cause something called the LH surge. So, that is the alphabet O. So, the alphabet O is a place where you see the LH surge. So, alphabet O is the one. So, answer is C. Alphabet O, answer is C. Which alphabet is showing surge of ovulation? At around alphabet O, you see the mid cycle LH surge. LH surge is the uh, temporary increase in the amount of LH, you know the release of LH, more than 15 international units, more than 15 international unit of LH, if it is there, it is ovulatory level, ovulatory levels of LH. So, from the onset of the LH surge, this question also come from the onset of the LH surge and from the peak of the LH surge. Yes, of course, the answer is C and the alphabet is O, that is correct. Now, from the onset of the LH surge, it takes around 36 hours. 36 hours to ovulate and from the peak of the LH surge, it takes around 12 hours to ovulate, 10 to 12 hours or you can write 12 hours. So, from the peak of the LH surge, it takes around 12 hours and from the onset of the LH surge, it takes around 36 hours for the ovulation to happen, okay. A lady during labor presented with persistent occipital posterior position, manual rotation was tried, but it was unsuccessful. What type of pelvis is this? Now, this is my favorite, uh, you know, discussion in the classes, occipital posterior. Please, uh, you know, they will ask you this question, INICT also, occipital posterior is the most common malposition. What is the most common position of vertex? Most common position is left occipital transverse followed by left occipital anterior. So, if you see left occipital, left occipital transverse, left occipital anterior. These are the common positions of vertex and most common malposition of vertex is right occipital posterior. So, occipital posterior, what do you do? You know, they will sometimes ask you a very simple question like an INICT. What is the management when you see occipital posterior in labor? Wait and watch because occipital posterior 80 percent rotates and becomes anterior and 20 percent stay, 15 percent to 16 percent stays posterior delivers as phase 2 pubis. So, occipital posterior 80 percent rotates to occipital anterior normal delivery and 15 to 16 percent stays occipital posterior and 2 to 4 percent rotates to occipital transverse. So, occipital posterior mostly will deliver by either rotating anteriorly 
or just staying oxyproposterior and delivering as phase 2 pubis. So, we all understand about oxyproposterior, let me try and show you in the types of pelvis. So, this is occiput and you should always see the uh, occipital posterior, you should always see the anatomical right and anatomical left of the image which you are seeing. So, we will ask you always anatomical. So, this is the right of the patient, this is the left of the patient. Do not see your right and your left, okay. See the patient's right and patient's left. So, this is the anatomical right and the anatomical left and the occiput here, see it is towards the right side of the patient. So, it is right occipital posterior. So, if you see the types of pelvis, most common type of pelvis is the gynecoid and the second most common type is the anthropoid and the rarest type of pelvis is the platyploid. So, you can see that the gynecoid pelvis is nice and round inside of the pelvis, but the anthropoid has parallel walls, okay. They are converging side walls. It is a long pelvis cavity, but side walls are uh, converge uh, side walls are parallel and they are not the best for rotation and droid pelvis see different from anthropoid. Anthropoid the side walls are parallel, android pelvis the front walls are jutting inside, the front walls the fore part of the pelvis, the front of the pelvis is narrow, it is android male type pelvis. So, the anterior part of the pelvis is narrow, the four these pelvic walls are narrow from the front, but the back of the pelvis is roomy and platyploid is anterior posterior flat. So, now if there is occipital posterior, occipital posterior, occipital posterior and occipital posterior. So, I am just drawing a arrow like this to show you occiput, the arrow is the occiput, the arrow head is the occiput. So, in a gynecoid pelvis, this will rotate wonderfully, all right. In a gynecoid pelvis, this will rotate like this. I will use a brighter color. In a gynecoid pelvis, this will rotate and rotate, it will become occipital anterior. So, in a gynecoid pelvis, the rotation that is rotation is possible. In an anthropoid pelvis, this rotation is not possible, this rotation is not possible. So, there is no rotation, no rotation possible, that is your MCQ, no rotation possible in anthropoid. So, stays occipital posterior, but staying occipital posterior it can deliver, it delivers by phase 2 pubis. Normally, you know the uh, head of the baby is uh, you know the occiput is anterior and the head delivers by extension and the face is towards the uh, back of the pelvis. But if the occiput is posterior, the head is towards the back of the pelvis and the face is towards the symphysis pubis. Let me see if I can uh, show that to you. Let us see, uh, if you can see this. Okay, see this occiput. Okay, this is the occiput. See this occipital posterior. So when this is occipital posterior, it will mostly rotate to occip. This is the occiput which is posterior. It will mostly rotate to anterior at the pelvic floor. Rotation happens at the level of the pelvic floor. So it rotates towards anterior and deliver happens. But sometimes if the occiput stays posterior, occiput stays posterior and delivers as occipital posterior. So now you can make out. See. If the occiput is posterior, this face of the baby, see, face of the baby is at the pubic symphysis, face to pubis. Where do you see face to pubis? When the occiput is posterior. So, face to pubis, where do you see? In a persistent occipital posterior. The third variety I have not written here, I am telling you, sometimes the occipital posterior rotates partly to occipital transverse. It rotates to occipital transverse. So, that will not deliver, transverse will not deliver. So, you can manually rotate it to anterior and apply a forceps and take it out, yes. So, that is what is the probably the next question which can come in your exams. So, when occipital posterior is asked in an anthropoid, please remember that is your MCQ which has come many times. No rotation possible, stays occipital posterior, delivered by phase 2 pubis. But in android pelvis, okay, I will have to write it here. In an android pelvis, it can rotate, 
it can rotate to occipito transverse like this it can rotate to occipito transverse and the remaining rotation has to be done manually remaining rotation a doctor has to be present and that doctor can do a manual rotation make him occipital anterior and deliver by forceps. So, we call it a manual rotation I am just writing the short form manual rotation forceps extraction in a android pelvis it can happen android pelvis it rotates to transverse and remaining rotation is completed by the doctor or she has a cesarean section if it is a neglected occipital transverse. So, if it is occipital transverse then mal rotation for subtraction it is not coming in exam so far but pg entrance it is a favorite mcq and remember anthroid pelvis is mci favorite mcq domain of uh, mci mcq two times it's come in the last two years and anthropoid pelvis no rotation is possible so that's why it stays persistently posterior and delivers by face to pubis let's see what questions you guys ask me about this one Yeah, uh, Shakti, it is known as when the transverse, the head is neglected in transverse, it is known as a deep transverse arrest. So, when they ask you deep transverse arrest, go ahead and see cesarean section. Otherwise, you can, uh, if you see it in time in the labor room, you can manually rotate a occipital transverse, okay. But that is in an android pelvis. Anthropoid, no rotation is possible. So, do not say manual rotation in an anthropoid, okay. Pelvimetry is mostly uh, x-ray pelvimetry used to be done, then uh, now MRI pelvimetry can be done, but that is to assess the head and the pelvis. But remember one thing, pelvimetry is not done mostly in these days because the best assessment of the pelvis is the fetal head. So, best assessment of the pelvis is done in early labor by the gynecologist and the remaining is done by the baby himself. So, the best assessment of labor is in early labor. Okay, so, X-ray pelvimetry and uh, MRI pelvimetry is not asked much because X-ray pelvimetry is exposed to radiation and MRI pelvimetry is too cumbersome a process and that is uh, the results are not so great, but the best results because what happens that the pelvis opens up a little in labor, the ligaments get relaxed in labor and the head molds a little, the head, uh, the bones will come closer to each other, molds a little and goes even through a slightly smaller pelvis for that head. So, the best assessment of labor is uh, best assessment of the pelvis is during labor by the gynecologist and remaining by the fetus himself. Okay. A 32 year old unmarried woman came with secondary amenorrhea, unmarried secondary amenorrhea at 32 years. She was having regular normal flow of periods so far, nothing was found on a pelvic examination, no other associated complaints, what will you do next? So, secondary amenorrhea 32 years. Now, married or unmarried, uh, I think let us not get confused at all. A 32 year old, if she is not having periods, rule out a pregnancy first. Yes, we always rule out a pregnancy first. So, do a urine HCG test. Of course, if that is, uh, no, I am not going to do a, a ultrasound first. Yes, we can do a pregnancy test and then we can do an ultrasound, of course. And if the ultrasound is fine, then I will do the hormones. Yes. So, for my this thing, I will go with uh, HCG first thing to do. The second thing, I will do an ultrasound. And between LH and FSH and eastern levels, if she is not having periods at 32 years, I mean it is an unlikely cause, but it can be a premature ovarian failure also. So, I will go ahead and look at both these levels. So, both of these, you know, A and B will be the third step for me. So, first, second, third step. All right. So, let us move on. A 14 year old girl presents with primary amenorrhea. On examination, secondary sexual characters are seen there is a normal vaginal development. On ultrasound, the uterus and ovaries are seen to be normal. What is your advice? 14 year old girl with primary amenorrhea. So, yes, what is primary amenorrhea and what is delayed cycle? So, I have been doing this for the last uh, one year wherever I have taken classes for my PG entrance students and also for my MCI students. I have been asking this question, what is delayed periods? Everybody says, sir, if there are no periods till 13 years, it is delayed. But if she has got secondary sexual characters, then it is 15 years. So, yes, 13 years is delayed cycles and 15 years is delayed when she has pubic hair. So, 
please, please, no, stop answering, okay, I, I know all of you are answering a lot of things, please listen to me about this. So, we say that if a girl comes with a mother and says, uh, the mother says that my daughter is not having periods, I examine her, she looks to be normal to me, like this MCQ which has given, she's absolutely normal at 13 years and she's got normal development of everything, she's got no period so far. So, I examine the uh, perineum and I see that she's got pubic hair. If she's got some pubertal development like pubic hair, we know that the periods can come. So, if she has pubic hair, then at 13 I will not bother, at 14 I will not bother, I will wait till 15 to say delayed periods. But she's got no pubic hair, no breast growth, nothing and she's got no periods, then at 13 itself I will say delayed periods. So, without pubic hair at 13, with pubic hair at 15. So, 13 and 15, first of all don't say 14 and 16. So, the question here is of 14 years, that question can come at these years, but the criteria is 13 years and 15 years. Listen, listen to me. Now, stop writing anything, listen to me. So, 13 and 15, that is the parameter. Now, that is delayed periods. How is it different from primary amenorrhea? Oh, bhai, primary amenorrhea is same as delayed periods. A woman never had periods, we call it primary amenorrhea. Woman had periods and now they have stopped secondary amenorrhea. So, woman never had periods is known as delayed periods or primary amenorrhea. Delayed periods is what laymen say, primary amenorrhea is what you and me say. So, yes, your neighbor comes and says, uh, he is a non-medical, he comes and says, Dr. Saab, my daughter is not getting periods. Uska period delay ho gaya hai. Aungla ki tete varle, no, nariya, you know, aungla padi moon varsha hai, chai vaise. So, if she is saying something, the relatives are saying something like that, their language is going to be delayed periods. Your language is going to be what? Okay, yes, she is having primary amenorrhea. So, that is the only difference. I asked a lot of students and they were, all of them they knew the answer to delayed periods, but they did not know primary amenorrhea. It is basically the same thing. It is a better way to say that, uh, I mean, it is a technical uh, method of saying delayed periods, primary amenorrhea, same as delayed periods. I am sure most of you knew it, but some of you keep getting confused in these definitions. So, chalo, let us move on. Yeah, if there is important hymen, then I will see. Oh, who is asking me this? Uh, Dr. Raj Anand. Yes, of course, if there is uh, important hymen, I will see it. If there is normal anatomy, see this question. There is normal vaginal development. So, we have taken out uh, important hymen out of this. So, girl is not having periods. Her mother brings her to me and I examine her and there is an important hymen. I will not ask her to come after 2 years or 3 years. If I see her at 13 years, I will correct the important hymen, obviously. Now, the case which I showed you was of a 16 year old girl and she had uh, not had periods, the mother had not bothered to check her anatomy or bring her to me, isn't it? So, if a patient comes late to me with imperfect hymen, that is their problem. But yes, imperfect hymen can be a cause of primary amenorrhea, you are correct on that. Question uh, next one, okay. A 19 year old girl with primary amenorrhea with normal secondary sexual characteristics on local and pericle examination, uterus was absent. Now, this is a different situation. 19 year girl, primary amenorrhea, normal secondary sexual characters that is pubic hair and always remember about pubic hair, okay. This pubic hair thing is going to come in many intersex topics. Intersex topic on prep ladder forum, please see that and on prep ladder app, please see, subscribe to this channel. Sometimes we will be doing intersex classes with you and I am sure that intersex is that uh, uh, hot topic which is going to come in a PG entrance exam. AIMS exam, the last exam which was conducted, that AIMS exam had how many? four questions on intersex, one exam on and four questions on intersex. It is a very interesting topic. So, what is the next investigation to be done when the uterus was absent? So, do an ultrasound or a karyotyping LH and FSH. So, when a 19 year old girl is not having periods, we will do a local examination and if you see the vagina is absent, then we will do a perical examination. With the perical examination, we can feel the uterus fit is present. So, the uterus was absent. So, when the uterus is absent, the next thing is we do an ultrasound and see whether its patient is having a uterus or not. So, we say it is a case of Mullen genesis. Sometimes uterus is absent and you see two undescended testes in the inguinal canal. So, that is testicular feminization syndrome, but in testicular feminization syndrome, there will be no pubic hair. This girl has normal pubic hair, secondary sexual characters. So, this is definitely a case of Mullerian agenesis. So, next investigation is a ultrasound. All right. So, uh, what have you guys answered? Have you answered B here, some of you? No, that is not the best answer. D is also not the, karyotyping is not the first thing to be done. 
No, 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 no. K to typing is not the first answer. That's the first question where uh, some of you answered wrong. No. Kerotyping is not the best answer. Why? Why did you say kerotype? No. See, kerotyping could be confirmatory, but we'll always do the else on first. Okay. So just to make sure that it's a, a normal uh, kerotype of a girl with a uh, absent uterus, so we can do that. But uh, no, that's not the first answer. Definitely not. Next question: A uh, para to live two patient was using IUCD as a method of conception. After six months of usage, she presents with vaginal bleeding and repeated blackouts, syncopal attacks to the emergency room. What is the likely cause? So now, to your satisfaction, I've given the question. The first question which I gave you, I've given the answer which you wanted to hear. That a para to live two patient was using IUCD as a method of contraception. After six months of usage, she presents with vaginal bleeding and a repeated blackout, syncopal attack. Okay, so blackouts or syncopal attack means the patient is going into shock. So a patient having syncopal attacks with an IUCD could be a woman who got pregnant with a tubal pregnancy which got ruptured. Yes, it can happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. Yes, but the incidence is not increased. Okay, I will not change that. Whatever you say. Okay, so answer is definitely a case of ruptured ectopic. Okay, fine. A second gravida para one live one. Okay, she is pregnant for the second time. She has a live baby. She underwent LSCS in previous pregnancy for fetal distress. This time she had an uneventful vaginal birth after cesarean section, but the plaster could not be removed completely. The cord snapped on traction, but the plaster did not deliver. She also started to bleed more profusely now. What is the likely reason for this? This is slightly deep, all right? And I was surprised that they troubled you with such a long history. So all of us know when the uterus has delivered, then we do the control cord traction. The plaster is here and we do the control cord traction. You know, we give a gentle tug on the cord and give a counter traction on the fundus of the uterus, control cord traction and this will come out. Why does it come out so easily? It comes out easily because there is this neta bush layer, neta buck or neta bush layer of fibrinoid necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis layer. So, this fibrinoid necrosis layer or neta bush layer is the reason why when you pull a placenta, it comes out easily. Now, if this layer is absent, if this layer is absent, the neta bush layer is absent. See, if this is absent, then the placenta will be morbidly stuck to the uterus. Morbid, matlab, very strong. When we say no, morbid, you know, this is, uh, there is a morbid liking of this person for that person, you know, morbid liking. So, so it's severe. When you want to emphasize something, we say morbid, okay, and generally not in a good sense, morbid. So this morbid attachment to the uterine wall, that whatever you do, the plasma doesn't come out. So when there is absent neta bush layer, when there is absent neta bush layer, it can cause a morbid adherence, morbid adherence to the uterine wall. That is what is known as a placenta accreta. So yes, those who answered C are all correct. That's a case of placenta accreta. It is very badly stuck to the uterus. Now, it does not come out. What if we do? It will not come out. In fact, like they said, this cord will also get snapped. This cord will get snapped. It will break and will come out and the plaster will be still stuck. And you try to remove this, she will start bleeding profusely. So this mostly requires a hysterectomy, placenta, accreta. Then if it is more deep inside, it is called increta. If it goes through the uterus to the fundus of the uterus, to the serosa of the uterus, that is rather, from the, uh, if it is badly stuck to the uterus, accreta, goes into the muscle, increta. If it goes through the muscle to the serosa of the uterus, it is called percreta. So all of these will mostly require hysterectomy as the best treatment, all right? Please remember that. So yes, uh, of course, some of us have been able to save most of these uterus, but when the bleeding is too much, we end up doing a obstetric hysterectomy. That is a hysterectomy for an obstetric reason is known as obstetric hysterectomy. It's much more complicated and bleeds much more. You have to be very fast and you should know your basic hysterectomy very well to do obstetric hysterectomy. It's a large, big 
uh, uterus which is very edematous and bleeding. So, yes to save the patient's life we end up doing a hysterectomy in these placenta creta cases. Now, what is the most common cause? Most common cause is placenta previa. So, answer to this question is placenta accreta. What is the cause of placenta accreta? The cause of the placenta accreta could be placenta previa. So, most common cause is placenta previa, also previous uterine surgeries like a, a, a myomectomy or a cesarean section or a DNC but the most common cause is placenta previa. All right, a 38 year old para 3 live 3 woman presents with severe secondary dysmenorrhea and ultrasound there is a uniform enlargement of the uterus up to 10 centimeters. What is the provisional diagnosis? Para 3 live 3. So, multi paras woman, older woman than 35, 40 years, severe secondary dysmenorrhea. Okay, we are thinking in terms of two things here. One is fibroid and one is adenomyosis, but endometriosis the uterus will not be enlarged, there will be cysts. So, it is not endometriosis and PID does not cause uterine enlargement. Now, between adenomyosis and a leomyoma, leomyoma is also known as a fibroid. Between these two which is a better answer? There is a uniform enlargement of the uterus up to 10 centimeters. So, fibroids are irregularly enlarging the uterus, the only thing which will distinguish. So, fibroid generally associated with infertility, not that multiparous women do not have it, but adenomyosis classically associated, classical association multiparous older women. So, that is why the answer is more strongly adenomyosis than a fibroid. So, what happens in a normal uterus? You see a normal uterus will look something like this. So, this is the myometrium. Now, if you see the endometrium, endometrium will proliferate from one side like this and from the other side also like this. So, this is the myometrial proliferation and the center of the cavity will not have anything. So, this looks like three layers, is not it? One layer, two layer and three layer. So, we call it a triple layer endometrium this is a normal uterus. So, endometrium, myometrium you can see distinctly. Endometrium that uh, uh, you know the magenta thing which I have drawn and the myometrium is the muscle layer all right here this is the muscle layer you can see it distinctly both these layers are seen distinctly. In adenomyosis this distinction is lost see this picture which I am showing you see this is the uterine outlining I am telling you this this is because this is from my hospital and I am doing the scan. So, I know this so well that this is a uterus. Some of you keep asking me sir where is the uterus in this picture. So, this is the uterine lining and this is the endometrium can you see you cannot see it so nicely. So, this is the endometrium and its distinction from this this is the myometrium layer this is not so good. So, yes endometrial myometrial distinction is lost and the uterus is uniformly enlarged. Can you see this so many white dots? Can you see this area and can you see this area of the muscle of the uterus? There are so many white dots in between the black. So, this is known as a dash and dot appearance also and then this is also a myohyperplasia uniform enlarged uterus. Please remember the uterus is never uterine size is always less than 14 centimeters in adenomyosis. This has come so many times. Please, uh, they have asked this question a woman has a mass in the abdomen which is uh, 30 centimeters in size. It can be all of the following except please it can can be a uh, fibroid uterus, it can be an over cyst, it can be a mesenteric cyst, but it cannot be a adenomyosis. Always the uterine size is smaller than 14 centimeters. Okay, now, this is the question which they like to ask you so many times the internal iliac artery which is the common obstetrical or gynecological condition where this procedure is done. So, yes we are trying we are already marking everything for you so that you do not miss out external iliac artery and then the um, internal iliac artery here this is the internal iliac artery and internal iliac artery has a posterior division and anterior division 
and the anterior division of the interiliac artery we are trying to pull the anterior i mean we'll try to uh, lift the uh, anterior division of the internal iliac artery so this is a instrument by which we can pass a ligature under the uh, anterior division of the internal iliac artery so when we can ligate this when we ligate this anterior division of internal iliac artery which procedure we are going to do this which condition we are going to do this for atonic pph all right fine so internal iliac artery ligation please read about it nicely i am going to give you the picture here please read about this and i am yes i am going to stand here take this picture please remember the anterior division and the posterior division branches please remember this is the posterior division this is the anterior division and we do not ligate the artery here okay we ligate only the anterior division we ligate only the anterior division and why do we ligate the anterior division because that is what is giving the uterine artery so branches of the anterior division and branch of the posterior division they will keep asking in the exams and the branches of the posterior division are superior gluteal ilio lumbar and lateral sacral superior gluteal ilio lumbar and lateral sacral are the branches of the posterior division anterior division has seven branches or eight branches sometimes they keep telling the minor branches also so more branches of the anterior division so they remember the posterior division branches short gills that's my mnemonic s gills or short gills or now schumann gills but uh, now you can remember short gills so uh, superior gluteal ilio lumbar and lateral sacral three arterial uh, trees from the posterior division and they this is the easy question which they ask you which is the anterior division branch which is the posterior division branch like that they'll keep asking you but sometimes they'll ask you worse questions what is the principle of internal iliac artery ligation the principle is that i am not ligating this artery totally i am not stopping the blood supply i am not making it so tight that the blood supply stops it is just a comfortable ligature to reduce the flow and anterior division only anterior division is ligated only the anterior division is ligated and we reduce the flow we don't stop the flow reduce flow promotes thrombosis and the bleeding stops in the uterine bed reduce flow promotes thrombosis and the uterine bed is the one in which there was bleeding so that thrombosis will stop the bleeding in the uterine bed and the atonic pph will be taken care of so this is one of the drastic steps which we have to do internal iliac artery ligation and if that doesn't work next is that we have to go into a obstetric hysterectomy again all right so uh, please read about this a lady of 23 years present to the opd with symptoms of lower abdominal pain and dyspareunia on pelvic examination there is uterus found to be retroverted also there was adnexal and cervical motion tenderness so 23 years young girl to the opd with symptoms of lower abdominal pain and dyspareunia and dysmenorrhea also should have been there i'll add that dyspareunia is painful intercourse dysmenorrhea should also be there in this question so dyspareunia and dysmenorrhea lower abdominal pain is not i mean lower abdominal pain uh, i must add dysmenorrhea there so lower abdominal pain dysmenorrhea and dyspareunia pale for intercourse on pelvic examination the uterus is found to be retroverted also there was adnexal and cervical motion tenderness what could be the long term sequelae of this condition so retroverted uterus because of adhesions you know endometriosis causes adhesions endometriosis causes pain in young girls severe dysmenorrhea and sexual intercourse is very difficult with uh, endometriosis very painful in uh, bad endometriosis especially when the, it is involving the pouch of douglas the most common site of endometriosis is ovary second most common is the pouch of douglas so intercourse will be painful so dysmenorrhea dyspareunia and retroverted uterus so endometriosis what is the long term complication of this the out of these questions infertility is the one which is most appropriate all right prolapse is the last thing which will happen to endometriosis patient why because there are lot of adhesions in endometriosis so those adhesions are preventive against prolapse at least so prolapse to kam hoga but yes infertility zyada hogi all right guys so similar question was there a nally paras 29 year old lady presents with infertility on examination the uterus is felt to be normal size but is retroverted in fix also there is tenderness in posterior vaginal fornix what is the diagnosis so endometriosis is one favorite mcq pcos is one favorite mcq ca cervix and uh, please read about improved hymen also 
vesicular mole also. All right, so there's some very common questions which keep coming in the INICT exam, and uh, the very fact. Why did I smile? Because some of these questions are so simple that I I get so upset that uh, you people are uh, getting too nervous and too uh, worked up about this exam. But some of you take it very light also. So that's you have to strike a good balance. Okay, some of these questions. See, look at most of these answers you've given so far. I can see that 95 percent of the answers all of you've given correctly. So you will get 95 percent marks in Gynae, I'm sure. So don't worry about uh, obs in Gynae at least. The questions are straightforward most of the times, and the difficult questions are only around 4, 5 out of 40. So 35 out of 40 is not bad. Okay, so have the confidence that you will pass, but don't be laid back and don't just sleep off and thinking that okay I will pass Gynae. So that way you are not uh, going to make it because other subjects also required and do not get too complacent and do not get too worked up. The right kind of nervousness and right kind of confidence keep that uh, you know the middle path. Okay, so this is again endometriosis and let us move on and see the next question. The following pelvic ultrasound shows the ovary. What disorder lesion is depicted in this ovary in this ultrasound? Okay, so uh, we are not able to see any um, cyst here, and uh, we are seeing multiple small follicles. Yes, I think there's no. I mean, um, I'm very sure in this just one view. See, there's so many follicles. Just one view of the ovary. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. The sixteen follicles in just one cut section. One. Uh, 2D picture. When you turn the uh, probe and see the other side of the ovary, you will see another 510. So, more than 20 follicles per ovary now. Okay? So, this is straightforward polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovarian disease. Now, more than 20 per ovary. Okay? Those who have uh, the previous notes around 2 years back and before, we used to say that more than 12 follicles per ovary, but that is outdated now. More than 20 follicles per ovary is PCOS along with Yes, anovulation and hyperandrogenism. So, three things are required. One is the ultrasound picture like this, ultrasound picture, then it is the hyperandrogenism, and then it is the anovulation. So, 20 per ovary follicles on the ultrasound, hyperandrogenism and anovulation, 3 of these are there out of at least 2 of these, 2 or more of these, okay? at least 2 of these are required for the diagnosis of PCOS. So, a lot of girls will keep asking us in the OPD that sir, uh, I have been diagnosed as a PCOS by the ultrasound. See the radiologist will see the ultrasound and ultrasound shows uh, polycystic ovaries, he will say that the report uh, will be polycystic ovaries. But if the lady has hyperandrogenism, and delayed cycles because of anovulation. So, anovulation, hyperandrogenism, at least one should be there along with the ultrasound picture. Then only the person is called PCOS. Just the ultrasound picture of PCOS is not polycystic ovarian disease or polycystic ovarian syndrome. This, uh, excuse me, this alone is not enough, all right? At least two should be required. A 30 year old uh, nulliparous woman presents for a routine checkup when an ultrasound reveals a unilateral ovarian cyst of 6 into 6 centimeters. What is the next line of management? Now, 30 year old nulliparous woman and cyst more than 5 centimeters. Anything less than uh, 8 centimeters is called a large cyst, but yes, 8 and more is a large cyst. So, less than 8 we can conserve, but the problem is that nulliparity has been given. So, 6 centimeters I could have said uh, just give some OCPs and wait for some time, do some investigations and wait and we can follow up, but she is 30 years. Best oven reserve is 25 to uh, 20 to 25, decent oven reserve for pregnancy in a woman's life is 25 to 35. So, she has got only 5 years of good oven reserve left and in that time if you are just wasting your time with the cyst, I do not think that is the best option. So, I do not know what was the size given in the exam, but this was the MCQ which was uh, uh, recollected and given to us and in this situation, I am going to say go ahead and do a laparoscopic cystectomy, assess the tubes and assess the other ovary and that is the best for her fertility. So, I would have said laparoscopic cystectomy. Open oophorectomy, no, do not take out the ovary. Oophorectomy means taking out the ovary, ovaryotomy or cystectomy is the better nomenclature. So, definitely not a ovarian cyst, ovarian removal. Okay. 
A histosalpingram of an infertile lady of 26 years showed the following results. What is the diagnosis? So, uh, this uterus is barely visible. So, uh, let me try and show you the uterus should have been here like this and this is the cavity and there is a cannula inside the uterus like this that is known as the leech cannula and the fallopian tubes are supposed to be like this, but the tubes are not like that. These tubes are so big, they are dilated tubes. So, yes, what is that? This lesion, bilateral uh, uh, fluid filled tubes. So, that is what is called a hydrosalpinx. So, hydrosalpinx is a condition where you will see a fluid in the tube. Tube is, if you take out the tube, we call it salpingectomy. Water in the tube, hydrosalpinx. Mesentery of the tube, mesosalpinx. So, salpinx is fallopian tube. So, tubes full of water, hydrosalpinx. What is that uh, lesion which keeps coming in the exam? That the uterus is having a tube which is like this, as big as a small, as big as a bag. It looks like a small bag. So, we call it a tobacco pouch, a tobacco pouch hydrosalpinx. Tobacco pouch, tobacco pouch hydrosalpinx. So, hydrosalpinx is fluid uh, filled tube and if it is so big that it looks like a pouch in which you can hold tobacco. So, that is tobacco pouch classical of tuberculosis. All right, let us see the next question. Which of the following is a contraindication for use of contraception shown in the image? Yes. So, what is the contraindication for this device? That is the MCQ. PID is a contraindication, hypertension is not. Postpartum is now a very important situation where you can give a IUCD and diabetes is not a contraindication. So, please remember control diabetes, control diabetes mellitus, you can give IUCD, you can give combined oral contraceptive pills. So, diabetes mellitus which is controlled, she can take any contraception. Uncontrolled diabetes, you cannot give any contraceptive pill because the liver is not doing too well, the sugar metabolism not good. So, the hormone will also not be metabolized properly. So, combined pill cannot be given. I used to if you give to an uncontrolled diabetic, there can be infections. So, both of these things cannot be given in a case of diabetes, which is not controlled. Controlled diabetes, you can give both of these. So, you can give a patient IUCD with diabetes. You can give a patient IUCD with postpartum. What is postpartum? PPIUCD, postpartum IUCD. That is after delivery, postpartum. You take out the placenta and once the placenta is out and the uterus is contracted, you put in a IUCD inside. The expulsion rate is only 12 percent, 88 that is almost 90 percent retention rate of this IUCD. I know you are thinking that so the uterus is so big after delivery and you put a small copper T device, the uterus is still going to involute, it is going to contract over the next uh, uh, 4 to 6 weeks and it is going to come to the normal size in 6 weeks. In that reduction of size, the copper T can be expelled, correct, good thinking. Earlier we used to think that it is going to expel 50 percent. Now, proven data, WHO data is that it is 12 percent expulsion only. That means 88, 90 percent of almost 90 percent women are going to keep the IUCD, it is going to stay inside. So, wonderful method. All our uh, ladies in the country, especially the uneducated ladies, those who are not very well motivated to come and take contraceptive advice, non-motivated. What is meaning of non-motivated? Unmotivated woman means they do not want contraception. They are not motivated enough for contraception. So, for such women putting an IUCD is such good thing. You put an IUCD after delivery and th they are not going to come to you after delivery, isn't it? So, put it immediately after delivery, put an IUCD. So, now when they want to have a child, then they will come to you and say, sir, please remove the IUCD after 2 years or 3 years when they come. So, they will at least not have unwanted pregnancies, okay. So, it needs motivation to take some contraception that if you want a person to have, uh, let us say, uh, combined pill, okay. She must on the second, third day start the new pack and then she should take one tablet every day. She should be motivated for that. She should have an implant in her hand. So, every two years, implanon, norplanon, whatever, then she comes two years or once in one year, once in th three years, whatever, uh, you know, implant. She has to come for a surgery for implantation and then for uh, after two years for a surgery to remove. She should be motivated. So, 
lot of you get confused that sir patient is unmotivated you can never put an IUCD oh hello we are trying to say what is motivated she is motivated for contraception unmotivated not motivated for a contraception so when she is not motivated enough putting an IUCD is such a good thing put an IUCD and she doesn't have to remember anything about contraception then it is a typical procedure where you fill it and forget it so unmotivated person put an IUCD inside and after that for 5 years she doesn't have to think of contraception and uh, if you put a paragard then for 10 years she doesn't have to think for a contraception so unmotivated people especially are uneducated masses of a country where unwanted pregnancy happens so many times population is bursting the country at its seams so much of requirement of uh, you know health planning and uh, uh, you know food planning and so much of uh, poverty is uh, staring at us and we are the most populous country now so putting this PPIOCD, I think you must, whenever you do internship, you must go and tell your seniors that, are you, you must go and ask them, are you putting PPIOCD? So, that is one method by which the unmotivated masses can be given IOCD. So, yes, postpartum you can give. Hypertension is not a contraindication. Well controlled hypertension, not having any excessive bleeding or something, you can go ahead and give. So, PID, current PID, previous PID is not a contraindication. Current PID is a contraindication. A woman who is lactating came to the OPD six weeks after delivery for checkup and should get an act, uh, advice for contraception. Which of the following is not advice? So yes, when a woman is lactating, the best thing you can give is progesterone lip pill, okay? And do not give combined OCP. So that's the answer. The estrogen component is known to cause inhibition of lactation. So we will not give the combined pill. We'll give progesterone pills. We can give the IOC like we discussed, and the mini pill is basically the progesterone. So yes, the best answer is for this question. The answer is combined OCPs cannot be given. Progesterone pill is the best method for lactation uh, patients, lactating patients. Which of the following is the obstetric give the obstetrician is trying to do? which is the obstetric grip this obstetrician is trying to do. So there are four grips, all right? The four grips which we do are these, one, two, three, and four. They are known as the Leopold, Leopold maneuvers, Leopold maneuvers. So Leopold one, two, three, and four. So you can take a picture of this uh, once again. I hope you can take a picture and read about this. Leopold 1 is the fundal grip. You put your hands on the fundus of the uterus and see what is occupying the fundus. Lateral grips to see where is the back of the uh, baby and where is the uh, limbs of the baby. And the, uh, the third grip is while looking at the mother's face, you see the lower uh, part of the uterus, lower segment. You see what is occupying the lower part of the uterus while looking at the face of the mother. And the fourth grip is looking at the feet of the mother, all right? So third is looking at the face and fourth is looking at the feet, okay? You can see the hands of the doctor here. So this third maneuver is also known as the first pelvic maneuver or the first pollic. And this fourth maneuver is also known as the second pelvic or the second pollux. So do not get confused, all right? The first pelvic is the third Leopold and the second pelvic is the fourth Leopold maneuver. And this is the one which you keep getting confused so many times because some forums have been telling some uh, the, the first and the second pelvic grip uh, opposite. But never mind, I am sure that you will remember this picture which I have given you. You can also go ahead and take this uh, uh, picture of this, uh, you know, this is from uh, Patrick O'Grady's book, my favorite uh, operative obstetric book, Patrick O'Grady's obstetric. So, you don't have to know which book it has come from, but I'm just giving you a picture because I must give credit to the people who've written the book. That's also important, okay? So, um, what is this grip being done? So, this is, you put your hand in the lower part of the abdomen and while looking at the mother's face, so this is what is the the third Leopold maneuver or the first pelvic grip. So this is the grip three, answer is C. So what did you guys write? Let me see your answers. Oh, most of you have been writing answers correct today. That's not bad at all. Okay, good. 
Woman with a history of abortion due to Down syndrome, now she is pregnant again at 11 weeks. What is the best diagnostic modality for this child at this gestation to rule out Down syndrome? So now when the baby has already the been a Downs, you know, previous baby was a Downs, now you are not going to do a screening procedure, you will do a diagnostic procedure. When there is a risk of Downs, let's say after 35, then you do the dual marker, triple marker and the quadruple marker, then you also do the uh, NTNB scan, NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing, all of these are screening tests. But we now want a definitive answer because previously there was a down. So a definitive test would be a chronic villus sampling, amniocentesis, chordocentesis where we get fetal tissues and we get a pakka diagnosis, we get a 100 percent sensitivity. So yes, 10 to 13 weeks we can do a chronic villus sampling and 16 to 18 weeks we can do an amniocentesis and after 18 weeks, after equal to 18 weeks, we can do the chordocentesis. In the chordocentesis, we get a fetal blood and fetal blood, we can run the karyotype much faster. So that is why this is the, these are the diagnostic tests, these are not the screening tests, the other diagnostic tests. All right. So the answer to this question is chronic villus sampling. A 25 year old married man came to the infertility clinic having azospermia. Normal side testes, FSH and testosterone levels are also normal. What could be the reason? So you know when a person has azospermia, let us just remember the same diagram. Just the uh, gonad hair has to change, the gonad hair from ovary has to change to testes, otherwise it is the same thing. Okay. So, when uh, hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary to make the gonadotropins, what are the gonadotropins? FSH and LH are called the gonadotropins. Now, they act on the testes and the testes will make testosterones and the testes will make sperms. Now, that is the only difference. Now, when the testes makes testosterone, please remember the follicular stimulating hormone in a man will act on the Sertoli cells to make the sperms and the luteinizing hormone will act on the Leydig cells to make the androgens. So Leydig cell make the androgens, Sertoli cells will make the sperms, this is the basic. So FSH for the Sertoli cells, S for Sertoli, simple way to remember and Leydig cells, LH, LH acts on the Leydig cells to make the testosterone. So if we just take off the ovary and make it a man's uh, system of hormones and the gonadotropins and testes are making the testosterone and the sperms, so this testosterone gives a feedback to the brain. So if the FSH is coming out and the LH is coming out from the brain and androgen production is happening from the testes, that androgen will give a feedback to the brain and the LH and FSH will be normal. Sperms are formed and the LH FSH is normal. Now, if there is a block, if there is a block in the vas, androgens will go from the circulation of the testes to the brains. So if there is a block in the vas, that is not going to give a wrong message to the brain. It is just that the sperms won't come out like the first uh, picture which I showed you. So the vas is blocked, the sperms won't come out. But yes, the androgen production will go on from the testes and give a message to the brain. So the brain will have a normal LH and FSH. So yes, when there is normal LH and FSH with azospermia, then we think it is a obstructed, obstructive azospermia. When there is a high LH and high FSH, we say it is a testicular failure and when there is low LH and a low FSH, then there is a central pre-testicular cause, there is a central cause. So yes, this has other names. So this normal LH and normal FSH, that is known as a post-testicular cause, post-testicular azospermia. 
high LH and high FSH is known as pretesticular azospermia and lower I am so sorry. that is high LH and high FSH means testicular failure that is called a testicular cause and then low LH and low FSH that means the brain is not giving enough information. So, that is known as a pretesticular cause. So, very simple I am just trying to relate uh, what information you already know about women. You know about women that when women have uh, uh, high LH and high FSH that means there is ovarian failure. So, when men have high LH and high FSH that is testicular failure. So, that is what I have given you here high LH and high FSH is testicular failure or testicular cause of azospermia. And normal LH and normal FSH means testis is working fine, but the path has been obstructed. So, uh, these questions also come in your exam sometimes yes uh, it is not so difficult I am sure you guys will understand. Okay. A woman with previous two abortions is undergoing the dilator test. So, what is the dilator test? You know, sometimes what happens in this cervix, we put a dilator like this, we see how much size of dilator is going inside easily. So, when you put a dilator like this, it should not, you know, only a uterine sound can go inside. You know, what is a uterine sound? It is an instrument like this, is not it? That uterine sound it is got a handle like this on this. A uterine sound can go inside the uterus to sound the depth of the uterus, find out the depth of the uterus that can go inside easily. But a dilator of 6 size, 8 size, 10, 12 we use for doing a D and C. So, what is the dilator test? When we try to put a dilator, you know see this is the cervix, this is the uterus, this is the dilator and I put the dilator, see this is like a size 8 dilator. If I put this in the cervix, it will go, it will not go easily at all. You will have to first put the sound, then the size uh, 6 and size 4, size 6, size, you know sometimes you put size 2 also, very thin uh, wire type dilators, 0 size also we have. So, we go sometimes with very thin dilators and then we go size 6, size 8. So, you cannot take a size 8 and directly put in the service because service is very tight. So, if I want to do a DNC, I will do a serial dilatation. I will go slowly dilating the cervix with serial dilatation from size 2 to size 8, size 10, 12 like that. But if a size 8 or a size 10 go easily into the cervix, then this cervix is little patulous. It is a little dhala dhala cervix. So, that loose cervix shows that the cervix is not tight enough that means it is incompetent cervix all right. So, that is what is an incompetent cervix. I think most of you got that correct yes. So, these are the dilators here see this this is the thin dilator here and then this is the thick dilator here and you can see that this is the size 12 dilator this is the size 14 and uh, if uh, a size uh, you know a size 8 dilator can go easily inside that means size 8 is that size by which we know it is roughly the size of this pen thickness this uh, uh, you know the uh, normal size of this uh, iPad pen which you have now the pencil this uh, uh, pencil the iPad pencil this is the roughly the size of a size 8 dilator if that can go easily into the cervix then we know the cervix is patulous this size dilator. Okay. A line drawn from the mid part of the posterior surface of symphysis pubis to the tip of the sacral promontory in red line is which of the following diameters of the pelvis. So, yes, they are asking you what is this red line here, what, what do you understand by this red line here. So, if you see the head of the baby, I will try to show you here like this, the head of the baby has to go inside this, if the head of the baby, I am trying to make an oval head because of the limitation of the space here. So, if this head has to go into the pelvis like this, then the anterior posterior diameter of the head, this anterior posterior diameter of the head should be less than the anterior posterior diameter of the pelvis. So, the anterior posterior diameter of the pelvis, which is the narrowest anterior posterior diameter. So, we will show you the pelvis here. See here this one guys. So, in this pelvis, if you see here from the tip of the pubic symphysis to the tip of the sacrum. Here you can see very easily from the tip of the uh, pubic symphysis, tip of the sacrum, there is one diameter. But from the back of the pubic symphysis, you see here 
from the back of the pubic symphysis the pubic tubercle. From here the diameter will be lesser. So, from the back of the pubic symphysis that what is shown here the diameter is the red color one and that is the smaller diameter than the green one and the blue one. So, this diameter which is smaller, this diameter which is smaller is the shortest diameter anteriorly at the inlet of the pelvis. So, if the head has to go it has to be shorter than this red diameter. So, this red diameter is of obstetric importance if the head has to go inside. So, that is why it is known as the obstetric conjugate all right it is known as the obstetric conjugate the red one. The green one is known as the true conjugate and the blue one is known as the diagonal conjugate. So, what can you measure? Which diameter can you measure in the outpatient department ok. So, when you do a per vaginal examination you can measure only the you know I know the length of my fingers as a obstetrician. So, from the base of my thumb to the tip of my middle finger I know the length of my finger. So, when I do a per vaginal examination in a lady I can make out from the base of the pubic symphysis to the top of the sacrum this much I can make out with my per vaginal examination. So, that diameter is the diagonal conjugate that distance is the diagonal conjugate. So, how do you see which one you can measure in the OPD the diagonal conjugate. So, DC is generally around 12 centimeters. So, the true conjugate or the anatomical conjugate is DC minus 1 11 centimeters and the obstetric conjugate is the diagonal conjugate DC minus 2 is equal to 10 centimeters. So, diagonal conjugate is around 10 centimeters and you know the anterior posterior diameter ok the anterior posterior diameter of the vertex the head which is going you know the head of the baby this anterior posterior diameter of the baby which is going into the pelvis if this head is going to the pelvis into this pelvis then the diameter of engagement is sub occipital pragmatic this diameter sub occipital pragmatic how much is sub occipital pragmatic 9.5 if that is entering this pelvis then this 9.5 should be sh lesser this 9.5 should be lesser than the shortest anteposterior diameter of the pelvis. What is the shortest anteposterior diameter of the pelvis? The red line which is the diagonal conjugate and in this you have seen it is 10 centimeters it is 10 centimeters here. So, diagonal conjugate is 10 centimeters and the anteposterior diameter of the head which is going to the pelvis is 9.5 that is why this head can enter the pelvis all right that is very simple. Ok, a woman presents with secondary amenorrhea, she has a history of curettage for abortion, FSH is normal ok, 2 to 6 is the normal FSH is around 7 it is ok, up till 10 it is alright, more than 10 is high FSH. So, FSH is normal, what is the most likely diagnosis? So, normal FSH and secondary amenorrhea, so pituitary is not failed because pituitary is giving FSH, this is more likely not an ovarian failure also because in ovarian failure FSH will be very high. So, pituitary FSH will be low, ovarian failure FSH will be very high, pregnancy it is not because uh, we have not given the uh, uh, tests of pregnancy, we have not given any other. So, yes this is obviously a case of uterine synechia. So, yes that is a correct answer that is a Escherman syndrome, uterine synechia also known as Escherman we will say synechia, we will say additions like that we will say. Which of the following does not increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy? So, this is a repeat question, we will not waste much time intrauterine and contraceptive device. Which of the following is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, SERM, selective estrogen. So, SERMs, what are SERMs? They are estrogenic at some places, they are anti estrogenic at some places, SERMs all right. So, uh, let us say reloxifene, tamoxifene and uh, uh, clomiphene these are all serms. So, clomiphene is also a serm is not it. So, reloxifene we use a serm for the bones because they are estrogenic on the bone. So, they are good for the bone health and osteoporosis all right. So, that is a serm reloxifene it is anti estrogenic on the brain. So, reloxifene has hot flushes as a side effect then tamoxifene is a serm. Now, tamoxifene is anti estrogenic on the breast. So, it is good for the follow up of a CA breast. In a CA breast which is estrogenic cancer after doing the mastectomy we follow up the patient with a, a tamoxifen treatment. So, that it prevents the 
growth of the C, I mean the recurrence of the C breast. But yes, tamoxifen is antigenic on the breast, but it is eosinophilic on the endometrium. So the side effect of tamoxifen can be an endometrial hyperplasia, even endometrial cancer sometimes. So estrogenic and antigenic actions. What are selective proestrone receptor modulators? Ulipristal acetate, isn't it? Ulipristal. Ulipristal is used for fibroids, and it is also used for uh, emergency contraception. Now, this drug has not been approved by the government of India for emergency contraception. It is uh, available in the country, but that is in the grey market, but uh, not of much approval. I will have to speak with my pharmacology friends whether the drug has been gain, given approval for emergency contraception. So far, emergency contraception, please just say levonorgestrel, okay? Emergency contraception, say levonorgestrel, do not say ulipristal. I am just telling you selective progesterone receptor modulator, one example I have given you of SPRM. And SCRM, of course, is the answer for this. Tamoxifen is a serm, okay? And it is a good treatment. I mean, raloxifen uh, is also a serm, and raloxifen is a good treatment for uh, osteoporosis. But yes, what is the best drug for osteoporosis? Yes, once again, my favorite controversy. So, for osteoporosis, from 50 years to 60 years, we say estrogen, and after equal to 60 years, yes, 60 years, we say bisphosphonates, all right. So, I am not going to this controversy we have discussed in many forums in my exams, uh, I mean, when whichever, you know, revision I have done, I have told you about this. So, from 50 to 60, we say it is estrogens and after 60, the best drug is bisphosphonates. Yes, hormone replacement therapy means estrogens. So, let us not get into that controversy again. All right, guys. So, a lot of questions which we discussed and a lot of facts and I think we have done fair amount of ops and fair amount of gynae and a lot of contraception also and uh, some ectopic pregnancy also came in the discussion and uh, stay tuned to this channel because this is the one on which we keep discussing many uh, uh, you know MCQs, many facts which we want to tell you before the exams and uh, also there is a forum on um, apart from Ops and Gynae, you will have another 18 subjects which can be discussed before the exams. So, stay tuned with us and uh, keep sending us your queries and what are you asking me now? Let me see favel uh, MCQs which you have. Okay, Dr. Lulu, thank you as always. You are such a good friend. And um, do we have part two? Do you want a part two? I mean, I do not mind doing a part two, but not tomorrow, guys. Come on, tomorrow is a busy OPD day, and they have asked me to do some surgeries while from my OPD. So, I will be very tired. So, I will ask my team if I can do another session. 30 July is a long time, and uh, we can always meet again. Come on. This is from home. This prep ladder has been kind enough to make uh, studios wherever we are living. So, I can do this from home easily. So, we can always, we can always uh, meet again in many forums. It is, we are all here for you guys. You can be rest assured. All PG entrance students, all MCI students, Preplat is meant to help you for online lectures, isn't it? So, we are here for you. Do not worry. Just give us a proposal and we will be there. First attempt, why little motivation, Komal Chandra? You are going to pass, man. Do not think it is your first attempt. Why are you thinking it is as your first attempt? This is the attempt you are going to use and when you are going to read, you have still another two months almost to write this exam and please do not think that first attempt to likh nahi hota hai, second mein hum log pass hota hai. If you guys are going with that kind of a thought, then please, you are wrong. You will pass in the first attempt. Those who cannot pass in the first attempt, bad luck, you know, because, you know, I always say MCI students have this one very big problem that when you people come back to the country, you have not been taught in the way we are going to ask you the exam. That is the only difference. I have been to universities, I have been to Russia, I have been to China, I have been to Nepal, I have been to so many universities. But I have seen that all of your hospitals are not bad, they are teaching you. Is that you lack a little bit of motivation because it is a foreign country and you know survival is a problem in those countries. So, when you uh, do not survive too well, you do not read too well, but those who read also when they come back, you have a problem because you are asked questions in a totally different way. Although the science is the same in all over the uh, world, all of the college, the science is the same. But when you come back to the country, when you come back to India, they are asking you questions in a different manner. So, this 
time when you are spending with us, learn that manner of questions, learn these questions which are coming, learn the way which we are teaching you because we are teaching you for a competitive exam. Your colleges did not do bad. I have seen your hospitals, they are very good, your teachers are smart. They are teaching you in the right way, they are making you doctors. But yes, here we want you to be doctors and also pass a competitive exam. So that is why you guys get a little nervous and then you think that we are not going to pass in 3-4 attempts. So I am preparing for my fifth attempt. And come on, that is wrong. Quite a lot of you pass in the first attempt. Let, um, let me tell you, most of you pass these days. Last time the percentage of pass people were more than 35 percent. Okay. A lot of you have been fed with the information that pass percentage is only 5 percent. That is nonsense. There is nothing called a 5 percent limit which the national board is making. You do well, you get 50 percent, you are all passed. As simple as that. The government is not so uh, hard on you guys. Come on. You guys will definitely pass the exam if you read uh, harder and you discuss more. Please discuss amongst yourselves and the first attempt will be your best attempt, I am very sure. Just in case it is your second or third attempt, then now you know the method of reading. Go ahead and pass this exam, guys. You have to write the PG entrance next, alright. So pass the exam and become my interns and we will rock it in the uh, gynae clinics and the gynae OT. We will uh, make sure that you work very hard and do surgeries with us, alright. And stay motivated, guys. Motivation is everything. Speak with yourselves and speak always that we are going to do it. Do not think that our lives are doomed. If you think your lives are doomed, then they will definitely be doomed. Always think that we are going to do it. Once you have this optimistic look towards life, then things more, more, more likely to become better than worse, alright. So God bless you guys and keep the motivation going and keep reading very hard and come back for another session whenever we get time. God bless you, all the best.